Good morning. Dawn has broken. Look at the incredible colors of the African sunrise here from the northeastern corner of South Africa. We are in the Kruger National Park and it is the most perfect possible dawn. Just behind that bush, one of the bushes you're looking at is a giraffe. There are a couple of others grazing down the slope. A herd of zebra grazes to the right-hand side of your picture, a herd of impala to the left-hand side. You are on a live safari with Safari Live, and my name is James Hendry. On camera today, we have jean -Dre. Hello, jean -Dre. Good morning, James. jean -Dre has a very nice hat on today, and a miner's light, for some reason. And on the other vehicle, we have making her way back from leave today, the inimitable Jamie Patterson. She is being filmed by David, and in the final control, we have Kirsten McLennan-Smith speaking in my ear, and Louise reading your tweets, which you can get hold of us on, hashtag Safari Live, questions at wildearth.tv or on the YouTube chat stream. Talk to us, ask us questions, give us your comments about how seeing a horizon like that makes you feel at this time of the day, whatever time of the day it happens to be where you are in the world. And also give us your feelings perhaps on that incredible zebra birth we had last night. The fact that Karula has a confirmed two cubs at this stage some amazing developments we had yesterday. Tinged, of course, with a little bit of sadness because Scott and Nikki are leaving us at the end of today. <laughs> and Michelle in New Jersey, you say you don't know what could possibly top the sunset drive from last night. Perhaps an elephant birth. So just to reiterate to those of you who weren't with us yesterday, we had Karula in a tree right on the edge of a drainage line. She was eating a, a young kudu, it looked like to me. And somebody drove into the drainage line to have a look at her from below. And there, two little cubs were spotted. Marvelous, marvelous stuff. And then, right at the end of the drive, we managed to see a zebra giving birth. My first birth, I've never seen a live birth before in all my 10 years, or just about every single colleague I've ever worked with has seen one, and it was the most profound experience. And here comes a little giraffe into picture. Look at this. This is a real perfect time for a semi-silent reflection, I feel. Very subdued dawn chorus. No lions calling. And just the odd drongo and the odd grey-headed sparrow calling from the birds. And our plan this morning is to head across to see if we can't find that little zebra foal. We have seen a herd earlier. I didn't want to put too much light on them. So we will go, as it gets a bit brighter, off to the right-hand side of your picture, try and pick that herd up again and see if we can't spot the little foal that was born yesterday. It's not often that I say I'm glad that there are no lions around at the moment, but I am extremely glad that there are no lions around at the moment because there is nothing easier to pick off than a newborn animal for a pride of five lionesses, which is the constituency at the moment of the Nkahuma pride. <laughs> and Maggie in Australia, you say, you say, congratulations are in order because I'm now the proud godfather of a new baby zebra. Well, yes, thank you, Maggie. I've always, I've always thought it's always been my great ambition, of course, to be the godfather to a small zebra. That will bring to three the number of godchildren I have. It's the only zebra, though, in fact, the only, the only non-human godchild I have. OK, there go the giraffe. They have settled us into the beginning of the morning. Let's head across to Jamie Patterson, get an update from her, find out what she's going to do for the morning, greet her warmly as she returns back from her leave, and we'll go and see if we can find that little zebra.
and a very good morning to all of you across the world and what a spectacular sunrise to be greeted with on my first day back. How incredible is the sky? It's the kind of sky that promises one of those baking hot late summer days. And so special to be back on Juma. And Juma's looking incredibly green and beautiful compared to when I left. Obviously, that rain made a huge difference. For those of you who don't know, my name is Jamie, and I have Dave on camera with me this morning. And I am back from leave. It is great to be back with you all once again. I'm very excited. Uh, yesterday, it was all happening. Karula with her cubs still around. It is such a great feeling. And then that zebra birth, I watched it last night, and Dave and I were just discussing that feeling is indescribable and to know that something like that is happening live is just the most special thing in the world now i didn't go far i've actually just been straight towards where that sun sunrise is actually when i say we didn't go far we traversed brent and myself traversed most of the kruger national park all the way from the top top corner Pafuri and the border of South Africa and Zimbabwe, but still in exactly the same reserve that we're in now, in our little, our little section of the Greater Kruger area. Now my plan for this morning is to go and find the hyena den, because I hear it's moved. I hear they've wandered around and moved back to the den at Aubrey's Road, so I want to go and pay them a visit. Most of our regular viewers know that I have a bit of a soft spot for spotted hyenas. And just keep your eyes peeled, because I can hear elephants moving in the bushes. So there's, so there's a herd in here somewhere. <laughs> Genevieve, you can with absolute pleasure. So Dave was on a camera with James yesterday when they filmed the live birth. And Genevieve is watching all the way in New York. And Dave actually spotted the birth, didn't you, Dave? Well done. And Genevieve wants to call Dave Dazzling Dave now as a result of that incredible moment. And speaking of, look who we've got here. It's OK, Zibi Zibi. It's all right. Oh, break really subtly. Here we go. Don't think it is James's herd. None of the foals look that new. They don't have that wobbly, fluffy look. But hopefully at some point today, we'll actually be able to catch up with that mom and her little one. Here's a baby there. A bit older. We'll keep an eye out for the brand new baby. Thank you so much to Lucy and Valerie and Marilyn, all saying to me, welcome back. I really appreciate it. And just while I'm on the subject, thank you to everybody for your birthday wishes yesterday. No, it wasn't yesterday. Sorry, it was two days ago. I'm a little bit lost track of time at this point. But thank you so much, everyone, for the happy birthday wishes. I haven't had a chance to respond yet, but I will get around to it. And there's nothing that made me feel more special than all of your incredible messages. It is wonderful to be back. And the promise of such amazing things to come. Let's see if we can get a nice view of these zebras for you. In this morning sky. I agree, Leslie. Leslie said that the sunrise is so beautiful that it should be against the law. I'm glad it's not, though. Really, just look at those colors. I don't know that you get sunrises to match the ones that you do over the African bush. I think it's the, it's the setting more than anything else. Of course, there's the colors, the spectacular colors as well. But just the setting of the bush, the smell of it, the smell of fresh elephant dung, which I definitely smell, and the sight of the animals wandering through as they have for hundreds and hundreds of years. Safe and protected.
Gilly, I'm just going to be quiet for a moment and we can listen to the sounds that Gilly's pointed out. Sometimes it's just nice to sit and listen. So Gilly was wondering about the sounds that you were hearing there. Oh. Trotting off. Gilly wanted to know if those were crickets or frogs that we're listening to that she's finding so relaxing. The answer is crickets. And actually, in this case, they're not, sorry, they're not just crickets. There's also cicadas calling as well. I've noticed a huge increase in the insect life around Juba in the 10 days that I've been here now. While we cruise along towards the hyena den and have a look and see their new, or first time for me seeing their new home, I mentioned that there were elephants breaking branches just off in the bushes in front of us, and I think that James has found them for you. There, just below the horizon that is pinkening in the sun, is a young bull elephant. And he is actually sitting basically outside what we call Inga's house, which is where Jamie and Brent and Scott and Nikki and Eugene live. And they will be very pleased to wake up to the sound of him feeding gently outside there. He's very peaceful at the moment. And he's picking up, you see, bits of grass. If they can eat grass, like I say all the time now, they will at this time of year. And that just is much easier for them to digest, easier for their teeth to grind up. And he's a young bull because he's on his own. And so you can tell that immediately. You can tell he's young just from his size. Here he comes. Isn't that great? Peaceful fellow. He's probably about 20. So not quite in the sort of fullness of his adulthood. He will reach his maximum weight only when he's about 40 or 50. And they will keep, he'll keep getting taller until the day he dies. But he, so he's, I mean, at that size, he's not going to be competing for mating opportunities. Now, I'm being kind of disingenuous because I'm making it sound like he's not very large. He stands at least 10 feet at the shoulder. And you can't see that, of course, from where you are because perspective is a little bit difficult. But about 10 feet at the shoulder, a large fellow. Probably about four and a half tons. That's 4,500 kilograms. Multiplied by 2.2 gets us to roughly, say, 11,000 pounds. It's a big animal. Oh, sorry about that, old boy. Wendy is just a bit noisy. Isn't that great? I'm going to sneak a little bit forward so that when he walks past this termite mound, we don't lose sight of him. Ex Ranger, you are making an amusing joke, of course, yesterday evening while we were watching an elephant bull, very similar size to this one. Uh, he's, I'm just going to pull off here. He's not that comfy with us. Let's let him get on with his life without the noise of the car. And you yesterday oh, were watching when an elephant bull, on cue with the exquisite comic timing of the great masters of comedy, uh, past wind. As I said, listen to the magic of the wilderness, everybody. He went. That was very funny. Um, and X rang you, Sam, am I going to wear a peg on my nose? It wasn't so much the smell as the offensiveness of his timing that I objected to. And of course, then the word. 
the word that is used to describe commonly in English what an animal passing wind is doing. It's my worst English word. But no, no pigs, Ixranga. He's actually picking out little forbs now. He's eat, picking out the string of stars flowers, the heliotropum plants. And Stephen, you've noticed, of course, that he's being extremely delicate with that trunk. He's picking out individual plants, heliotropum plants with their little white flowers. Obviously very, well, I mean, obviously got something in them that he likes. And they're probably very important to his health. Interesting one here from Lauren in New York. Is it the length of an elephant's tusks an indicator of his age? Lauren, I would say almost universally not. Yes, of course, they do get bigger as they get older, but this guy is never going to carry big ivory. He's always going to have a small set of tusks, and it's very much variable on genetics. So it doesn't have a huge amount to do with age at all. Much better way of aging an elephant is the size of his head, the shape of his head, and his just his general size. So while those tusks will get bigger and bigger, they're never going to be those massive things that sort of touch the ground. So try and go around him. Jacob, you say that elephants are the only other mammals beside human beings, well, most human beings anyway, that have chins. Jacob, I'm... Well, I don't really understand. I'm going to have a look. That's fascinating. Now, let's have a look here for a chin. Now, as far as I'm concerned, that bottom thing there is the bottom jaw. I suppose it might be described to have a chin. What do you think, Jandri? I mean, I, uh, <laughs> I think that an elephant's chin is maybe a little bit more protuberant than perhaps a uh, a kudus, but I mean, if I, if you think about a, a horse or a dog, that bottom jaw still extends out and closes down below the top jaw. So I'm going to say I don't agree with that. I'm afraid it is a little sharper, I suppose. But I've seen some people with much less sharp, sharp chins than um, than that. Now, he is eating a Combretum calinum tree. They love this sort of thing. And Mr. Lynn, you say, would an elephant, I think, age faster during a drought because they have to eat more in the way of trees and bark, and therefore their teeth will wear out a bit faster? Yes, Mr. Lynn, I suppose they wouldn't age faster, but um, they will become more stressed because the nutrition won't be what they want. And obviously their teeth will become slightly worn out. But over the course of an elephant lifespan of 55 or 60 years in this area, they will experience a number of droughts, of course. And I don't believe that that will necessarily make an enormous difference. So one drought won't necessarily knock off, um, won't necessarily knock off years off his life. And, um, you know, if an elephant has been in this area in 54, 55 or 60 years, I think you'll find that all elephants have experienced some sort of drought during that time. And so I don't think this particular drought is necessarily going to knock extra years off the elephant's ages, if you know what I mean. Thank you, Miss Lynn. That was a nice question. 
Still, he's just walking from this, these uh, variable bush willows from one to the other, and you can see all of them here have been absolutely macerated by elephants over the years. They've been pulled over, broken, and their trees just sort of grown into bushes rather than trees. I think they're really rather attractive. Very nice, Andre. You picked the one that wasn't a variable bush willow. I started on a variable bush willow. <laughs> Hello, Jamie in Alabama. Ooh, I see some zebra down there. Uh, you want to know if the aromas and smells of the bush are stronger in the morning than they are at any other time of day. Uh, Jamie, yes, I would say they probably are. I'm not sure why that would be the case. Perhaps because the air is cooler and therefore instead of the particles that make the smells disappearing up into the air as they, eat, as they heat up, they're probably settled quite close to the ground where we are, and therefore the smells are that much stronger. But yes, definitely much stronger smells at this time of the day, or oh, and sometimes at night. Nighttime smells very different in the bush. And I remember that from we weren't a family that went to the bush very often um, when we went on holidays. But well, the one thing I do remember quite strongly from going on holiday to the bush was the smell in the evenings after the sun had gone down. So I'm sure that's got something to do with it. I'm sure it's the heat. And as the heat dissipates, the particles that smell that give the aroma sink down towards the ground, where we are, obviously, and that's what we smell. Now, there are some zebra down there. Maybe our little baby is there. But let's just stick with this little elephant for now. The Kimba. You want to know how much an elephant eats every day. Well, the most reliable source we have is only from a 10-year-old cow. And she was eating about 150 kilograms of foliage a day. We think a big bull will eat double that, 300 kilograms, 660 pounds of food in a day. And of that, about a third will a third to two-thirds will come out as dung. So vast amounts of dung get deposited on the ground, very important for the fertilization of the soil <coughs> out here. So he's eating bits and pieces of the tree. I think the tree probably has... Um, it's quite interesting here. He's moving from tree to tree. He's not doing a huge amount of feeding on each one. And I suspect that they are doing that communication thing where the trees will produce a pheromone that goes into the air that, create, that causes trees of the same species to increase tannin production, tannin levels, and that means that the elephants then will have a distasteful time at all the trees of the same species. So he tried the first combretum, ate a little bit of it, then he tried another two and kind of gave up, and now he's moving along trying to find those heliotropum forbs on the ground. That tree that he's going to there is a silver cluster leaf, which he's, he and his friends have destroyed at various times during the course of the summer. And Donna, as you say, they seem so quiet for their size. They don't just seem so quiet, Donna, they are very quiet for their size. It never ceases to amaze me. I mean, if I turn off now, we won't hear a thing from him. stop here because I think if I go around the other side of the bush there he's going to become irritated now look what he's doing he's trying to get the grass out from underneath the tree there this is an acacia tree that means the soil underneath it will be extremely nitrogen rich and that means that the grasses underneath it will be very nutritious isn't that cool Listen to that. So not, oh, gee. <laughs> How cool is this, everybody? So he's just moving the tree. He's not trying to destroy it. He's just trying to move it so that he can get at that lovely fresh grass. It's 
called a black monkey thorn tree. He's just digging there. Let's see if I wonder what he's digging for. Now an acacia tree is a legume, interestingly enough, and so it's got nodules under the ground which will produce nitrogen, and I wonder if he is looking for some of those. Tim digging there. How cool is this? That's it. What are you looking for? All the way around he's looking. There's something he's looking for in the soil there. All the way around the tree. I've never seen this. This is just so epic. He's only about 10 meters from us. He's looking for something. He's like a truffle hunter. He's looking for truffles, Jean, right? I hope so. I'm hungry. <laughs> He's just trying to toss some, toss some sand on himself. No, oh, don't go away. Keep going. Oh, that was so cool. <laughs> that is really amazing. Hello, Evie. You're in New York while we watch this marvelous fellow here. And Evie, you want to know if elephants can jump. Evie, I'm not sure if it's apocryphal, but I'm pretty sure it's true that elephants are the only mammals, land-based mammals, of course, that cannot jump. Now that said, I saw a photograph the other day of what looked like a young elephant, sort of all four feet in the air. And I don't know if it's been doctored or not. I've never seen an elephant with all four feet off the air. Now by jump, of course, every time you run as a human being, any time any animal runs, it is essentially jumping from foot to foot. So there is a time at which all feet are off the ground and that would be qualify as a jump an elephant seems to be unable to do that so a little bit like a power walker when they move fast they're actually walking really quickly they don't ever have all four feet off the ground and so i would agree evie that they are unable to jump i think the strain on their joints would simply be too big too great although that said He's just picking those heliotropums again. I'll try and find you an example of one. Chandra, I don't know if you can see this white flower here, but that's what he's eating. You see it there? Just there. Yes. That's what he's picking. Every time you see him sort of trying to pick things off this clearing, that's the plant that he's picking up. Well done, Chandra. Um, but what's interesting also is that a, a rhino can jump and a, when you watch a rhino run, it doesn't look like it's, it's, it looks like it's sort of trotting, but then if they get a fright, they canter. I mean, they, they, <laughs> they, they, they do that three beat canter like, a, like an antelope or a horse would. And you cannot believe A, the speed and B, the bouncy sort of agility that a massive animal like that has when it's running. And it's completely unlike watching an elephant run. I think we're gonna leave him now, everybody. We're just gonna let him wander off down the road there. He's not that comfortable with us. And what I want to do before they go too much into the thickets is go and see the herd of zebra, which is just down the way here and see if we can't pick up our little baby foal that we saw yesterday being born. <laughs> Another nice question from you this morning. Good morning to you. Um, you're in New York and you say that it's quite clear that nature provides all of the necessary nutrition for the animals out here. And you wonder 
if any diseases or most of the diseases that animals do suffer from from time to time out here are perhaps caused by nutritional deficiencies. Ravi, I would say that that is certainly true to an extent. Remember, as mammal life or life, uh, an enormous part of our existence, and you don't even know this is happening within your own body, is fighting off pathogen attack, fighting off parasites, parasitoids, viruses, funguses, and bacteria, which threaten, you know, would, would threaten your health. As soon as your nutritional status drops below a certain point, those pathogens and parasites are able to take hold. So, yes. When an animal, including an animal, including a human being, is, has sufficient nutrition, they can normally fight that stuff off. There's a tiny zebra. Surely that can't be our little thing already. Running around. It can't be after a night. Look, <laughs> it's chasing the impala. This is so cool. I can't believe it, cannot believe that that thing was born last night. I don't see how else it could be any other way, though, to be honest. Chasing the Impala. Let's see if we can find the mother. I don't remember what she looked like. Well, I mean, she was a zebra, obviously. but. Yes, thank you, Kirsten. I knew that was going to come in my ear. She looks like a zebra, says Kirsten. Deeply helpful. <laughs> Sarcastic git. Let's just roll down the hill here gently and see if we can't spot it again. And I just wonder if the mum won't have some kind of indicator Maybe a bit of blood in her backside. Yeah. Mm, no. There are some more. There are two kinship groups of zebra here. There's one in there and one here. And obviously a woodpecker going. Tick, 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 tick. I think that one might be a little bit old. Chandra, just if you don't mind, the, that zebra with its bottom facing us, it seemed to have some moisture between its back legs or kind of what looked a bit like moisture. It flicks its tail. No, it's not, that's a stallion. Definitely not him. Maybe it is this little one. I mean, I just can't believe that it's that big at this stage. I don't see another little one in there, though. <laughs> I can't believe that an animal after less than 12 hours on, well, 24 hours on planet Earth is able to move at that speed. There it is. There is a young zebra. It is covered in a sort of brown, so I mean, it looks like it's quite dirty. There's its mum. Let's see if we can't see an indication of whether she's obviously just given birth or not. calling. I think that's our chap. And as Kirsty says, wouldn't it be a bit smaller? Well, I mean, I would have thought so. But they do, I mean, they always are a lot bigger than you think they are. No, that, it can't be. Anyway, we'll keep looking around, everyone. We'll just see if we can't find another very small one. I 
That one looks almost too big to be suckling. Mother is not being particularly uh, pleasant when it comes to the suckling part. Great plethora of animals here on this clearing today. Marvellous to see. And behind us you can possibly hear a bearded woodpecker making his territorial tap, 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 tap tapping. Now this impala rut is already beginning. The males are already starting to get a little bit antsy with each other and you can hear that kind of noise that make they make that kind of snorting roar and this will go on of course until the middle of May okay let's go across to Jamie and the hyena den what I want to do is just do a little loop around past where I think I heard another zebra alarm calling and just see if we can't spot an even smaller foal than we've just seen. We'll see you shortly. I have to be honest, I am in absolute heaven here this morning. We've got such an active hyena den, and just to see the size difference of our favorite cubs since in the last 10 days since I left is quite astounding. And to see the December twins, <laughs> oh, you're getting bullied there. They are precocious and full of energy. Precocious enough that I've actually had to tap the side of the door a couple of times because they keep nibbling on my bumper and my tires to the point that they were even shaking the, oh, got a stick. Shaking the car. It's actually a bone. I can hear them crunching on it. And they are one animal that is going to thrive in the drought. Oh, oh, squabble, sibling squabble. They're so special. It's one of the things that I absolutely adore about the live safaris is the fact that we can actually watch these animals <laughs> grow up. Somebody's been lying in mud. This is an awesome sighting, but they are fully playful, and I believe that James has found an interesting sign of the events of last night. Let's have a quick look. Just very quickly, everybody, I have heard some alarm calling. That is the afterbirth from the zebra. This is where she gave birth, so the answer as to whether she would eat it or not has been very definitively answered. No, she wouldn't. This will be eaten by probably vultures or other birds during the course of the morning. Right, we're going to carry on, follow up on those alarm calls. Back to Jamie at the den. Well, James rushes off to follow those. <laughs> Alarm calls. I'm just going to let the action speak for itself for a moment. Ouch! Amazing how tough these animals are. Very definite size difference between the December twins. Now, when you watch them play like this and the way that they behave, you could easily be forgiven for thinking that hyenas are dogs or part of the canine family. But of course, they're not. They're in fact a totally separate family and it's part of the hyena family. So it's broken into felids, the cats, canids, the dogs, and hyenas. Totally separate branch. But if we go far enough back in terms of evolutionary design, this is in answer to Sad Emma's question. Sad Emma was saying, and Sad Emma, I hope you're not feeling terribly sad this morning. No, no, I hope this not. is cheering you up. Let me just turn James down slightly. Ahead, James. Sad Emma was... <laughs> Hello. What are you doing? 
hyena cubs everywhere. Sad Emma was wondering. So why are they more closely related to cats than they are to dogs? And if it's very far back, I'm talking tens of thousands of years back in the evolutionary history of these animals. And it's mostly to do with the structure of their paws and their feet. Now that's just in a comparison between animals we sort of know, but if we look at other structures, for example the anal gland that they have, and hyenas we often see them anal paste around the den, they invert that anal gland and paste a very smelly substance, I'm just going to turn James down ever so slightly, sorry James, um, but that also puts them closer to things like mongoose, civets, honey badgers, the Mustelidae and the Herpestidae families. So there's also a link there in terms of the, those designs. But if we go far enough back, if we had to compare them to either dogs or cats, it's slightly more closely related to cats. And that's why when we talk about the cubs, we call them cubs and not pups. Although gambling around like this, this little one's got, oh goodness, too fast dashing about. The little one has something that the older one wants and is now playing a game of come and get me. Such a far cry from when we first saw these cubs and they were wobbly and brown. Huh. Oopsie! Inhaled the bone. Don't choke little one. by the back of the neck. See, it's crunching a little bone there. Dashing about. This is the first time I've been to this den in a while. Funnily enough, I'll tell you a story about this Aubrey's Road den. I actually found it the first time they used it months ago when I was still bright-eyed and bushy-tailed. Not that I'm not now. But when I very first started working for Wild Earth, I found this den initially and it was purely by chance. We were actually in an elephant sighting, Liam and myself, hello mischief. What you going to do? We were actually in an elephant sighting and we just happened to stop so I could rummage around and Nikki, who was directing at the time, suddenly picked up on the fact, because we turned the camera aside, we weren't live, she suddenly picked up on the fact that there was a hyena cub that had come right up to investigate, just like these guys are doing now. And we followed them back to this den site. I'm glad to see them using it again. It's actually such a perfect, I mean, how many have we got? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, at least. All in this nice open area, so it's a lovely den site. And I'm so glad we managed to find them as quickly as we did after they moved. But Herbert, you were wondering how far we are from presumably the Mvuba Road den, which was their previous den. Herbert, we're probably, um, and I don't have the map with me at the moment, we're probably about a kilometre and a half would be my rough guess, which puts us at a just under a mile away. It's quite far. I mean, for those, the littlest cubs of the bunch who are already getting their spots, which I'm surprised to see, the matriarch's cubs, that's quite a trick. Look how big they're getting, big and bold and brave. I haven't seen November yet. Oh, those little ones, even though they are so tiny, have got enough strength now. Oh, goodness. Just think about, sorry, I did slightly sidetrack. Just think about your puppies and your kittens at home. And just think of those sharp teeth that they have. Now just imagine that combined with the jaw strength of a young hyena. And you can imagine how much those nips hurt. You'll notice they're going to be very gentle with that young cub. You don't want to mess with the matriarch's babies. But yes, even at that young tender age, they probably would have walked at this point. Uh, when they're still at this brown fluffy stage, when they're still wobbly with their wobbly back legs, at that point their mothers may carry them if they decide to move dens. So for example, Corky moving the December twins months ago, when she moved them across to the Galago shortcut den, she would have carried them at that age. They were probably about maybe a month and a half, two months old at the time. But now at this stage, even the tiniest ones, like this little bundle of terror, would be able to walk across. It would just be quite a slow process. It would be interesting to know, I mean, hyenas are primarily nocturnal animals. But it would be interesting to know if they moved them during the day or at night. At night, of course, they've got the advantage of their security and their night vision. Hello, Corky. 
and as well as the fact that that they know the area better in the evenings. But then during the day, they've got much less chance of encountering something like a lion or a leopard or one of the other threats to the cubs. So I'd be interested to know if there's any pattern to whether hyena cubs move during the day or during the night. My guess would be they move their cubs in the early evening, but that is just a pure guess. That's a little bit, I was gonna say that's a little bit big for you, but <laughs> seems to be doing just fine. Look at this, a scene of familial contentment and fun and games. Safari Dean has said that hyenas are just so funny to watch. And they really are. I mean, look at this December twin that's currently tugging on a massive bush willow branch. Now investigating and chewing. And they will be teething still. So it's not just exploring with their mouths. It's also relieving some of the pain of the teeth coming through. But they are, it does make for highly entertaining viewing. And of course, this play, as much fun as it is for us to watch, and probably is fun for them as well, they clearly enjoy it. But even then, it is so crucial in developing their later skills in life, their coordination and their strength and technique. This little one has just barreled in and stolen, oh, the bone or attempted to steal the bone away. Oh, but not giving in without a fight. Just like children, it's mine, but I want it. I want it, fine. I'll go find my own bone. They are so fascinating. There's nothing like those hyena eyes. I know they've got such a terrible reputation, but those big brown eyes are so soulful and full of expression. But in terms of design, they're the most incredible creatures. And both Lucy and Logan, Lisa and Logan, were wondering a little bit about, she's heard something. I don't think it's too serious though, they're not reacting too much to it. They just all looked up with their ears up. And you were wondering a little bit about the design of the hyena. So Logan essentially asking, what are the advantages to having those long legs? And Lisa was wondering, you know, why are they designed the way they are with those sloping backs? There's a couple of reasons. So hyenas and lions evolved pretty much together in the same niche and are essentially each other's main competition. So the lion is the apex predator, but hyenas are active at exactly the same time. They're also nocturnal, they're meat eaters, they're predators. So they've evolved alongside each other. And what you found is that hyenas have become evolved to be nomadic in a way. They're not completely nomadic. Obviously we've got territories with the clans and their territories, but they do cover far larger distances than lions do. And it just gives them an opportunity, particularly in the much more open, for example, desert areas, parts of Botswana and Namibia, to cover enormous distances in search of food and to actually scavenge from lion kills. So that sloping back is actually an advantage because it gives them a very energy efficient gait. The long front legs mean that the back legs, they actually have to walk sort of almost with a swinging motion. They barely put any energy into moving their back legs. All of the power is in the front and the back legs just swing up behind and crossing from sort of left to right so that they don't step on their own toes essentially when they walk. And then the other reason, the other big advantage, is that hyenas are capable of crushing bones, which is of huge advantage. They can get into the bone marrow that's something like a lion. Despite the fact that lions will eat the smaller bones, they cannot break into those femurs, those humeruses of the, carcass, of the kills that they make and actually extract the most nutritious part of that bone, which is the bone marrow. Hyenas with their big strong jaws can, but Big strong jaws also come with the need for muscle attachment areas. So they need powerful shoulders and powerful necks. And they've actually got what's known as a keel along the top of their skull, a ridge along the top of their skull, which serves as an attachment point for all those tendons and muscles. So the powerful front quarters give them or partly contribute to their 
bite force as well as the fact that they have that energy efficient gait. And there we go, practicing on a young cub. Building up what will become fearsome, crushing, powerful jaws. And yet they play with each other so gently, sort of. Sometimes it gets a bit boisterous. I'm with my favorite baby animal, or one of my favorite baby animals in the area, but I believe that James has found another very special, very sweet little baby for you. Oh, it's just so very tiring after a night of walking around with the herd, trying to find things to eat all the time. Oh, all around us there are elephants, everyone. The one is very cross now because there's some zebra that disturbed him. There really is a real abundance about the place today. Elephants everywhere we look. <laughs> Hear them pushing down trees and off to the right-hand side once we've looked at those. Two or three kinship groups of zebras with stallions and attendant mares or wives. Morning station. But still no little one. Still no very tiny one. And we did hear some alarm calling around here. It sounded like a sort of plaintive wail, but everyone here looks pretty chilled out. You know, the zebras don't look particularly panicked. The elephants don't look panicked at all. So I don't know what that was. We'll just roll gently forward and see if we can't get another view of these little elephants. But they really are all over. I mean, they're in front of us, behind us, or just grazing through the woodland here, grazing and browsing, of course. Come on, Wendy. There they are. Hello, Audrey, age 12. It's not a silly question at all. Now, please, all of you, anybody who thinks you have a question, you worry that it's a silly question, please don't be afraid to ask it. Um, this is unfamiliar territory for many of you, and so there's no such thing as a silly question. And Audrey, yours is especially not silly. You want to know, you thought elephants had bad eyesight, so how on earth do they... Oh, there we go, that's what I was hearing. It's just a fight, it's a zebra fight. Others alarm calling now. It's just some conflict, some internal turmoil within the kinship groups. That's precisely what we were hearing. <laughs> They're not very nice to each other, are zebra. Um, Audrey. Elephants actually don't have very bad eyesight. Their eyesight is probably as good as ours is. Um, maybe a little bit better at night. Uh, maybe slightly short-sighted compared with us, but it's not bad at all. But a lot of the time when they're feeding, remember, they've got very sensitive sense of smell. They've also got a very sensitive edge of the trunk, which can tell what they are feeling. So they'll feel what they, they want to eat. I think it's got largely to do with smell, though. There will be some element of sight involved. But they don't have bad eyes. They're not like rhino, for example, which are virtually blind. Well, I say that. I mean, I've been standing from close to or far from rhino, and they've definitely seen me. I think it's probably more difficult to say exactly in what way they're bad. So perhaps they are a little bit short-sighted. Perhaps they just don't see detail very well. It's difficult to say. really is abundant. <laughs> Leslie, you said there was a black mamba in a tree and it happened to bite an elephant. Uh, what effect would it have on the elephant? Well, I think the effect it would have on the black mamba would be to br break its teeth off in the elephant's skin. I think it really struggle to get a bite in through that incredibly thick skin. So I really think it would have no effect at all. Um, 
if perhaps it did manage to get through the skin and bite an elephant, I think you'd find the elephant would feel almost no effect. It would depend very much on how old the elephant was and on how healthy it was. But if it, I mean, if an elephant, if a mamba was to bite a fully grown elephant bull, no, I think it would have absolutely no effect at all. Action at the hyena den, let's go back to Jamie. You've arrived just in time to watch one of the December's twins tentative dismount from the termite mound, having a bit of a game of I'm the king of the castle this morning. Well, Kefi does it. A couple of weeks ago, that dismount would have been far less graceful and probably would have involved the odd tumble. I've been looking for November. I still haven't found November. I don't know where he or she is. I'm pretty sure November is a he. I don't know where he is. I've seen Madam and Corky, and I thought I saw Pretty at one point. So, Kimber, you were wondering where November was as well. I have been looking. I haven't seen him, but I actually haven't looked around the other side of the hyena den. I sort of started here because this is where most of the action was. But I haven't been around the other side, and I just heard a, a, the sort of the low moaning contact call of a hyena. So it could be that Pretty is on the other side of the den with November. Well, I'm surprised that November hasn't come in to join the fun and games. Look at that round belly. They've obviously not been going hungry. And as I mentioned before, this is one animal that is going to profit immensely from the drought conditions. I mean, Brent and I were driving through Kruger. We encountered about, probably about four or five buffalo that had died of natural causes, basically too exhausted and hungry to continue. And at that point, there were hyenas all around and vultures all around, but all of them were actually too full to even start feeding. It's going to be a time of bounty and plenty for these hyenas, or the hyenas around, around the country will be able to reap the rewards of a very, very tough season. It was also fascinating to see how few animals were around the rivers in Kruger because all of the animals had sort of packed themselves around the river, rivers in the last few months. There was just no food around them for the animals to eat. Fascinating. It looks as though this den inside is slowly settling down once again. I'm going to try and loop around, have a look and see if I can find November. And while I do that, let's head back to James and his elephants. Elephant right close by here, everybody. What she was doing, she's just telling the little one, there's a little baby as well, that was very close to us, and I don't think she liked that. And she came up, look, she's calling, jean I don't know if you can see that one behind her. She's, she's calling, she's making a low rumble, and that little one came running from behind there, and then the very little one in front of us here is looking very cross indeed. It's amazing. I think she was just sort of almost asking the question, saying to them, just watch out. I don't know what these guys want, so I'm not particularly worried about them, but don't get too close and don't talk to strangers. It was almost exactly what she came to do. This little one was standing here sort of watching us. She started doing that shake on one leg, which indicates discomfort. She walked over. She didn't shake her head at us at all. She took a piece of sort of leaf off the tree that is right in front of us, made that rumbling sound, and eventually, and then the little one turned and looked at us. So it was almost exactly like she'd said, just look out and watch out for those things. And now she's relaxed and gone off to eat. And the little one has sheepishly gone behind the bush. Really fascinating stuff. stuff. And that little thing is probably about 18 months old, maybe a little bit younger even. 
and already trying to eat the thorny, <laughs> thorny branches and leaves of thorny trees. There's another one scratching his ear. It's such a wonderful morning. Chin spot that is going. White browed scrub robins. Southern black tits. There's just zebra everywhere. I think they're going off back towards quarantine clearings. We're gonna loop sort of back around in that direction, I think. Simply because I really hope that we will be able to find the digitally one. Now, Majikla, you want to know that little baby zebra from last night would possibly have some umbilical cord still hanging from her belly or his belly. Yes, I imagine he would, you know. Probably, certainly the remnants. I'm pretty sure that other one was too big. I'm 95% sure it was too big to be the one we saw being born yesterday. I just got so hopeful as I began seeing what I wanted to see. I just rolled on down the hill. I say there are elephants everywhere. Still more over here. All right, we'll see if we can get another view of them. Jamie is still with those wonderful hyenas. Let's go back to her. Come around to the other side of the den, and I think, I could be wrong, but I think that that is pretty lying down there. It's a bit difficult to tell when it's a flat hyena, but I think it might be. And if it is pretty, then November's probably still around, just sleeping somewhere in the den, decided to have a bit of a lion, as teenagers often do. I think that's maybe why we haven't seen November. We also haven't seen one of Madam's cubs. Also hasn't made an appearance yet. So obviously cuddled up together in the den site itself. It's actually, a really nice and open den. They've all moved back now that I've decided to come here. They've all decided to cross back to the other side. Naturally, the interesting aspects of live wildlife filming. We've just got pretty sleeping in the sun. I think it's pretty. Hyenas are going exploring. I think we should go exploring with them. And while we do, I'll answer Elizabeth's question about hyena hierarchy. And Elizabeth, it's actually a very tricky one. But basically, Elizabeth wanted to know at what age the hierarchy starts to show when the cubs start to grow up. It's a really, it's a fascinating question. And hyenas are complex animals. To say that we have a complete understanding of the way that their society works, would be a little bit of an overestimation. And of course, the fact that different hyenas live in different areas, they have different environmental circumstances to deal with, will naturally change their behavior as well. Are you guys gonna come to me? If I go around, are you gonna come back here? Yes, because that's what we do. So Elizabeth, essentially the hierarchy shows as soon as the cubs are born. The cubs of the matriarch, for example, will automatically inherit her status. And the other hyenas will treat them with a degree of subservience. And the reason they do that, of course, is because that is very fiercely enforced by the mother. She's usually the biggest, toughest hyena. Not necessarily the oldest, but definitely one of the most precocious and maybe even aggressive would be the correct term to use there. It's difficult. You don't want to really throw words like aggressive out there. But the matriarch does tend to enforce her status through shows and displays of strength and power. So Elizabeth, essentially, it starts to show as soon as the cubs are born. Once they're older, though, it becomes a little bit different because, of course, the matriarch can have several sets of female cubs and automatically, females are higher ranking than males in all circumstances. Were you getting a little bit too brave, you two? Matt, dash back to the den. 
I'm just waiting for them to feel comfortable before I turn the corner. Getting braver and braver in exploring their world. What have you found? Oh, a thorn, I imagine, was exactly what that one found, a thorn to the gum. But once the hyena cubs, once the hyena cubs are older, it starts to change. So usually the matriarch's older cubs, her older female cubs, will have a higher status than the younger ones, just by age and by size. So things change a little bit. She initially will be extremely protective of her new cubs, but once they are adults, once they're sub-adults and adults, they start to fall in below the other cubs. And while I try and catch up with our dashing hyenas that seem to be leading me on a merry dance around the den, let's find out what those elephants are now up to. There is another elephant bull, and he was just putting some sand on himself, giving himself a bit of a scratch. They say, of course, that elephants throw sand on themselves for to get rid of ectoparasites. I don't know that that's necessarily true. I think maybe it just feels nice. I'm not sure how sand would get rid of ectoparasites, but there are elephants all over the place this morning. This has got to be the fifth or sixth group that we've seen today. And see how the light has changed. It goes white very quickly these days. Young bulls, lots of young bulls on the fringes of the herds. And I think these guys are probably going to head towards Treehouse Waterhole, see if they can't get some mud. Now, the mud, of course, is an effective ectoparasite remover. <laughs> They're all so relaxed. It's just wonderful. Oh, lovely question from X Ranger. I love the subject on the subject of smell, and you say that smell is one of be supposed to be one of the senses that we use the most to remember things. And there's no question that a smell can spark a memory in you from years and years ago that you haven't thought about. I remember a friend of mine telling me a story of his wife. Um, they were standing in a lift going somewhere up in a building, and she lift stopped, opened, and someone got into the lift and. It, closed again as they went up this woman started to his wife started to cry and they got to the top floor and you know everyone dispersed out of the lift and he said what's wrong and she'd smelt something on the woman that had got into the lift from her childhood and it had just sparked an emotional response that she was unable to control so absolutely it completely sparks memory and I think it does. If it does that for us, we don't have a powerful sense of smell. We have a much more powerful sense of smell that we, than we think we do. And we interpret a huge amount through our noses subconsciously, much more than we consciously are aware of. But I think for animals, it's even greater. So yes, the sense of smell is po powerful and will create a powerful reaction, emotional response in many of the animals here. Let's continue around the corner here. Originally going to go towards Treehouse Waterhole, but let's just go there quickly. The giraffe, it's unbelievable, there's just everything going on here at the moment. Luke, you want to know why it is that well, they say an elephant always remembers? Um, Luke, I think you'll probably find it comes from folk tales, to be honest. But, um, oh, sorry, elephant never forgets, always remembers. Um, I think you'll find it comes from folktales, probably. I don't think it's necessarily true, but I will say to you that there is anecdotal evidence that they remember individual people. There's anecdotal evidence that they remember um, individual events in their lives and traumatic events, and that memories can be sparked that can re create an emotional response in an elephant. All right, let's go back to Jamie. She's still got some action at the den. So this is absolutely fascinating. We've had a surprising visitor to the hyena den. A couple of striped horses 
zebras have decided to come and visit the den. There's one that you can just see there. It's been so interesting to see the reaction of these animals, of the hyenas, to the presence of the zebra. Initially, the zebra kind of came walking in as though they were going to chase the hyenas away, and the cubs scattered everywhere. I should be able to reposition now. I couldn't earlier because there were hyenas all over the show. But they were actually, the hyenas were growling at the zebra. Let's go around because they still have a little bit of a standoff. The hyenas dashed off with tails held high. You know that sign of excitement. Just make sure I don't drive into a tree or into the space of a hyena. But it was so incredible to witness. The hyenas being very protective. The cubs initially terrified, but after that, relaxed and actually curious. Now, a zebra is an aggressive animal. This we've seen many times play out in practice. So they can and often do chase animals like wild dogs. Generally, hyenas are not a threat to zebra, but they do fairly regularly go after and hunt their foals. So it would not be impossible. It's not impossible that they might decide to try and chase each other. The zebra are still there. I think they've actually moved off. Sabrina, you were wondering. Sabrina is one of our 12-year-old viewers. You were actually wondering if they're any kind of threat to each other. Hyenas will hunt, as I said. They will, particularly now at this time of year, with lots and lots of young zebra about, there is the possibility that they will hunt down and catch a zebra foal. And of course, being the stamina-driven animals that they are, a baby is a fairly easy target for them because they, a baby will tire far more easily than an adult zebra might. You can see the nervousness in her body language. Cubs are excited, tails up, full of curiosity. They've got to be careful, though. It's unlikely that a zebra could catch them, but it is a possibility. And if a zebra did manage to catch a hyena cub, as unlikely as that may be, it would be probably mean death for the hyena cub. I don't think it's likely to happen. The zebra have actually moved off. But it's caused much excitement around the den. Right. So those low moaning sounds that you may have heard are submissive noises. It came from the adult hyena, actually, that was sniffing the cub, and it was making very, very submissive sounds. We've always suspected that Corky, the mother of the December twins, is quite a high-ranking individual. Look at them all. There's a, they're all anal pasting, wandering around. Most of them have moved into quite a thick block ahead of us, behind the zebra. The zebra have moved off to quite a distance. But you can see how a visitor to the den has caused a little bit of chaos and confusion and excitement for the cubs. This is all new and interesting learning curves for them. I'm trying to figure out where the matriarch went, where Madam went, because Madam was the one who initiated a very protective charge towards the zebras, and she was the one who was actually growling at them to try and scare them away, which she did very effectively. I think we're going to go on another merry dance around, around this hyena den. Let's just go forward a little bit, see where they're going. Most of them seem to be heading back towards the den now. Oh, is that, could that be November? I think it might be. I think November's just popped its head out. Definitely one of my favorite animals. Yep, there's, hi sorry, on the left there, that is November. I'm fairly certain November's decided to pop his head out. Good morning. You had a bit of a lion this morning. You've missed all the excitement now. That's why it's worth getting up early, mister. <laughs> Bright-eyed and curious, standing on top of one of the other hyenas, oh, clambering over each other like jungle gyms. Now, watching the spotted hyena is a fascinating and unique example of 
and a complete exception to all of the mammalian rules. And what's so interesting is that the other hyena species don't follow this pattern where the females are larger than the others. So for us, the one other hyena species that we get around here is the brown hyena. And PK, I know you were asking about that. Oh, all fun and games. I'm glad they've decided to come onto this side. PK was wondering if there's any areas where we see both or different types of hyenas and that you would love to see brown hyenas. This is actually one area, although the habitat is not ideal for them, but within the low felt itself, we get both species. We get the spotted hyena and the brown hyena. I believe that one brown hyena was seen once in the seven years worth of live safaris. That was with Peter Pretorius, I believe. And there was much excitement as a result. It hasn't, one hasn't been seen since, and that's because the habitat and the lion density, as well as the spotted hyena density, all plays a role in keeping the brown hyena numbers at bay. They tend to prefer a slightly rockier habitat. They often den in caves, in rock crevices, rather than termite mounds, although they will use termite mounds as well. So it's always a possibility, PK. The one thing that you won't see that you did ask about is the striped hyena. And that's because there aren't any in South Africa. They're more adapted to the northern areas of Africa. They're far away from us, there's a tree climbing hyena there. <laughs> Practicing using a jungle gym, treating the den site as a, whoops, obstacle course. And as I said, these are essential skills that they are learning. How awesome is this? When last did you see a hyena up a tree? Maybe a slight exaggeration on my part. Down we go. You're all going to go back to the other side of the den, aren't you? Think definitely thinking about it. Oh, there's another head that's just popped up there to the left. Hello. Now, it was interesting to watch the youngest cubs, Madam's cubs, dash straight back into the den as soon as the zebras came through. Oh, we are so fortunate to be able to sit with this particular hyena family. He is poking up over the top. There's just too much going on. The cubs are so curious, they don't know where to look and where to go. Angie was wondering whether or not there's a possibility of there being other hyena dens or other active hyena dens. We're lucky. Oh, somebody got a little bit too playful and boisterous. Wondering whether there were any other active den sites. Since we're so fortunate to have all of these different age sets together and all of the females together, it is distinctly possible. So the larger a hyena clan gets, the more likely it is that they will use separate den sites. Now, I suspect, this is a suspicion, we don't know for certain, we will never know for certain, but I suspect that all three mothers of the youngest cubs here, Madam, Pretty and Corky, I suspect they're all part of the same female line. So a clan can have different unrelated female lines all together protecting the same territory, but they might be, for example, if they're not related to each other, it might be more likely that they decide to den in separate areas. I I don't think that this clan has any more active den sites at the moment. I don't think there are any others. I could be completely wrong about that. We do a fairly regular check of all the different den sites. Of course, that's how James refound this den and dis discovered that it was active. I don't personally think that there are any other active ones in, within belonging to this clan. But go two kilometers to the west of us and you get across to the Elephant Plains clan, which is apparently absolutely enormous, numbering 30 to 35 hyenas. I'd say we've only probably got about 15 to 20 in this clan at the most. Um, but they are a much larger clan and they have sev probably have several den sites around Elephant Plains. So we're only talking really in our little area. But throughout the four million hectares of wilderness, as we do a merry dance again, back across. Now, I've been trying to identify the hyenas that I've seen today, but it's been so chaotic, I haven't actually had a, a proper look at all of them. But Lance was actually wondering whether or not there are any males at the den today. Lance, I think there is one. 
and I actually think that that is the sub-adult known as Bella. Pretty sure that Bella's been around while we've been watching all of this action. So she's been here. I mean, he's been here. And we're fairly certain that Bella is a male. It's always a bit tricky to tell with hyenas. There are ways, and they involve very careful examination of the genitals, because of course females and males in spotted hyenas look so similar. But you can, if you look very closely, see a slightly pinched tip to the natural penises of the males. They're not quite as broad as the pseudo penises of the females. So I think that there are some males around. I think Bella's definitely here. I haven't seen any of the adult clan males. There's a couple of them that we know fairly well. One of them was quite a nasty, when I left, had quite a nasty injury to the neck. Definitely going to heal up nicely. But was looking very uncomfortable. But I think probably they're spending a bit more time towards the Juma Pan and the Galago Pan. They seem to enjoy resting there. Back around we go for the, what's this, Dave? Third time? I think it's third time. Third or second time that we've come around here. Now this is a perfect den site for them. Let me try not to smack us with a branch. Let me stop here, otherwise I'm going to frighten this little cub away. Chewing in the hyena dung. I don't want to give it a fright. This is a really wonderful den site for them. It's not quite as maybe picturesque as the Avubu Road den, but of course that's not really a consideration when you're a hyena. Lance was wondering what, how do they choose den sites? What is appropriate for them? Hello, November. I see you. Oh, you up now. Up and about. So Lance, what they're looking for is a nice termite mound, generally. Almost always with spotted hyenas, they will actually den in termite mounds itself. And they'll go and look for one that's been excavated by or broken open by something like an art fark, possibly even that's been inhabited by warthog families because they hollow them out nicely, or even porcupines, and they'll then adopt those. But what's interesting is that spotted hyena clans will reuse the same den sites over and over throughout the years, which makes sense. If you've got a place that you know works as a den site, it's a good place to be. The rest of the hyenas are actually playing off over there, but it is very dense bush, so we won't be able to get any closer to them. Now, despite their fearsome reputation, and they do get quite a bad rap, our poor hyenas, Dylan was actually wondering, how dangerous are they? How aggressive are they to man? And the answer is they're not at all. They're fascinating because alongside with evolving with lions, they've also evolved alongside man. And they are definitely never, ever going to attack a person in, for example, either in broad daylight or at night. There are cases of hyenas injuring people. And the reason that happens is because people are sleeping, it's when people sleep out in the open, unprotected, without any kind of watch system. And hyenas will then go and investigate them, have a good sniff, and quite possibly, as I've spoken about before, explore with their mouths. So that can result in very serious injuries. It doesn't often happen, it's very uncommon. But obviously you don't want to be sleeping out here in the open at night. We are not nocturnal creatures. We have evolved to be diurnal creatures and we are definitely not the apex predator at night. So that is the only real time that a hyena is a threat to a human being. And generally if you encounter them at night, all you've got to do is clap your hands shout a little bit and they will dash off. We've had to do it once or twice because of course they like to come and explore the campsite because campsites quite often mean food. It's only when people start to feed them as well. There's one other, sorry, now that I think about it, there's one other situation that becomes dangerous and that's around campsites and fortunately it stopped. It became a very big pattern in the Kruger Park over the last sort of 10 years or so that people were feeding hyenas chop bones, so they were starting to spend more and more time around camps. So if you ever do come and visit, please, please, whether it's baboons, spotted hyenas or monkeys, please do not feed them. 
They come to associate people with food, they lose their natural fear, and then they do become dangerous. And nine times out of 10, that animal then has to be removed because it's become a threat to people. And that is such an unfortunate situation where people are responsible for that. Our hyenas appear to be playing games with us. They're disappearing off across and into some very dense vegetation. I think I'm gonna leave the hyena den for now. It's been an awesome morning, start to the morning. I'm gonna head out and see what else I can find. In the meantime, let's find out what Mr. Hendry's been up to. Oh, no, we're not going to go across to Mr. Hendry because Mr. Hendry appears to have lost signal. In that case, we shall go forward and see which adults are poking their heads up over. And in a very strange turn of affairs, as we leave the hyena den, Mr. Henry has found a hyena and his signal, so let's have a quick look. From one hyena to another hyena, and this hyena, of course, is over here, because Karula has left the area where her kill is, and the hyena can smell something. Unfortunately for him, the kill is in the tree. <laughs> and the hyena will not be eating that meal today. I think this is one of our males, if I'm not mistaken. Those of you who are the experts here can let me know. But this is why, I mean, it's a little bit dangerous for Karuna to have had her cubs here. I mean, there is a kill, obviously. And so why she would have brought her cubs around here yesterday, I find odd. They were seen this morning crossing to the south, so back towards where her den site was. So, I mean, she's not around here and there's no danger. But I just find it odd that she would have brought them towards a kill, which obviously attracts hyenas. Yeah, she's running. He's running away now. Maybe he's just decided that it's, you know, better option somewhere else. Anyway, um, we'll just give you a quick view of the kill. I just wanted to come and check what was going on here. And there were reports of Karula going back south with her two cubs a little bit earlier. And I wonder, maybe she moved away because it started to smell and she knew that it would attract the attentions of hyenas. Those cubs are now, we think, probably about five weeks old. They will be beginning to think about starting to climb trees, but I don't think they'll be right at the tree climbing age yet. And until they are, I mean, if we bump them on the road or something, then we'll, 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 we'll probably view them. But I'm not going to go looking for them until we know that they're of a tree climbing age, which will be probably around six weeks. So very soon, you know, we'll, we'll be quite happy to actively track. No, they're bumped into their Anyone, anyone went to look for her today, and they bumped into her to row in on the road. So there is a bit of dodgy signal here, everybody. I'm afraid. Sorry about that. I'm not sure how it how out of this area but we'll try and move into a more well a better a better signal area for Wendy. Wendy needs a bit of work done on her obviously since her prolonged absence so she I know I promised I would leave, but I actually don't want to. Excuse me? Really? Really? Do you need that tire in your mouth? I don't think so. I don't think so, Mischief. <laughs> oh, hyena cub just came out from underneath the car. <laughs> you get an idea of just how comfortable they are with our presence. Although that does, should not really extend to nibbling on the body work of poor old Rusty. Rusty's got enough to deal with without hyenas chewing on her. Now, I've just seen both black cubs make an appearance, Madam's cubs, which means that every single cub made the transition from the Abubu Road den to this new run. 
completely safely. Yeah, very experienced mothers, these. I, uh, 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 I see you. I actually, I can see your mouth on my door handle. And <laughs> here's mischief. Please don't chew my car. Not really, except what's interesting about this is that only the cubs do it. They don't grow up to do it as adults. It's a cub curiosity, which is why I'm not hugely concerned about it. It doesn't become a really bad habit that they then take forward into adulthood. I've never ever, and I've watched lots of generations of hyenas grow up, I've never seen them do it past a certain age. It's just that initial burning curiosity, and they are one of the most intelligent animals out here. And just like toddlers, that plays out in mischievous ways. Oh, exhaustion. Total. It's been a very busy morning. All kinds of exciting things happening. One of the reasons I'm actually still here is, oh, cute. You can see those sharp teeth. Now those, those, sorry, I'll, I'll come back to the reason I'm still here in a moment. Oh, what gave you a fright? What's there? A little bit jumpy. Right, so one of the reasons I'm actually still here is I came to investigate one of the adults that was lying up towards the den site. And I've actually found June's mom. She's sitting, well, she's lying right here. I'm fairly certain that's her. You can see that huge scar on her back. That looks to me like it's June's mom. Haven't seen her in a while, so it's really nice to see her back at the den. There, that deep scar across her back. Probably from a very lucky escape from a lion, or possibly inflicted by other hyenas. We've seen her involved in skirmishes before. Quite seriously involved. Nice to see her looking very full and very healthy. And here to look after June as well. Definitely an old hyena. And with all of their cheek, you can imagine the answer to Marlo's question. Marlo was wondering, would a hyena actually run off another animal? So basically chase them out of the den site in order to occupy it. Now, I'm pretty sure that if something like a family of warthogs, for example, was living in a den site that was already established as theirs, there's a very, very good chance that the hyenas will actually chase them away. They might even kick porcupines out of their burrow. <laughs> got, got the cub by the back of the neck. It's fascinating to watch them learn fighting techniques. Grabbing the back of the neck to avoid those nipping teeth. Not impressed. You can see how with the sub-adults, they've already got their adult's teeth. What are you coming to do? Hello, November. Under the car again. Straight under the car. And now... I'm gonna try and duck. I don't even think you can. You can't see them from where, from where you are. They're all underneath the front wheel. There we go. They're moving out away from us. Try and keep my head out of the way. The hyena den's keeping Dave very busy. But you can see there's a tremendous difference, which is what I want to try and show you, but they're just they're so busy being busy that they're making it a bit more difficult. But whenever we see them, just have a look at the difference in terms of the, the milk teeth of the little ones compared to the adult crushing weapons of power. Here you go. Straight across in front again. I think this time I really, oh, no, I was going to leave, but November was underneath my wheels. It's just hyena cubs everywhere. It's gonna be even more entertaining when Madam's cubs actually get to the stage where they decide to come and investigate us as well. Then we're gonna have three sets of mischiefs to deal with, plus the sub-adults that are still a bit brave. Remember how in the beginning, the November and the December twins, it took such a long time to be brave enough to come out and about and explore. Oh. Oh. Trying to chew on, sorry, I'll try and keep my head out of the way. Oh, 
that's interesting from Judy. Judy was wondering if I had heard about the wild dog attack on the scarbacked female. I'd heard about the wild dog attack. I had not heard about the fact that it was the female with the scar on her back. I'm trying to see now, really she's healed up. It's miraculous, the healing power of these animals. She doesn't seem to have any serious injuries, but thanks, Judy, I didn't realize it was her, but I did hear another one racing up to come underneath the car. I did hear about the attack. It's very, very common for hyenas and wild dogs to actually encounter each other, more common than we get to actually see the interaction take place. And what I've learned over the last few months is that it's very rare for the hyenas to be killed by the wild dogs. It does happen, but it's very unusual. Most of the time, they do exactly what that hyena did in that attack, which is back into a bush and bare their teeth and get a couple of nips and some nasty bites, but nothing that will result in their death or anything close to a very serious injury. That, of course, depends on the situation as well as the number of wild dogs. It's so interesting the way that they vie for the top predators and top predator spot. Now, I think I might steal this opportunity to try and remove myself from the hyena den. I'm hoping there's no cubs underneath the car. As soon as I turn on, though, we'll find out. I think I've accounted for all of them, though. And while I do that, let's find out what James is up to. We've come back to quarantine clearings now just to see if we can't see a little baby tiny little zebra. But I don't see anything here at the moment quarantine is devoid of animals as of course will happen as we head towards it's certainly not getting hot yet but as we move towards the middle of the morning the zebra tend to wander off into the woodland as do the impala and then they come out into these clearings of course during the course of the night in order to see what's going on but let's just do a little turn around here i'm sorry we lost signal there it just seems to be the way of things with wendy at the moment like i say she just returned from a prolonged sojourn to Pretoria, and we need to just refine her a little bit further. Jigger is now also in Pretoria. Right, now, Jody. You are Zumi Jody. You have read that a zebra cannot see any other zebra for up to 12 to 24 hours because it needs to imprint its mother's stripe pattern. I can categorically tell you that that is nonsense because I saw it yesterday where the zebra little baby was surrounded by the rest of the herd for a little while definitely saw them whether it imprinted the stripe pattern or not i don't know i don't buy that stripe pattern imprinting thing unless i see evidence of it i'm afraid i won't believe it and i'll tell you why it's because i don't understand why it would be necessary when you have things like impala which look identical to each other they can recognize each other's lambs uh, easily the lambs can recognize their mothers easily why would it be the case that an animal would evolve a strategy for its foal to recognize the mother where it had to remain isolated from the rest of the herd for 12 to 24 hours which is of course incredibly risky behavior because it means that you are on your own and you've only got your eyes to look it would be incredibly risky and, in, and incredibly seemingly evolutionarily stupid um, strategy when smell or I don't know how else they do it but maybe yeah you know, maybe just smell is the most obvious way for a youngster to find its mother so I'm afraid I don't buy that theory zoomy Jody I've read it as well many times I'm just I've yet, yet to see it I can't, I can't believe it I think there are lots and lots of people trying desperately to figure out why on earth zebras have stripes. <laughs> Ravi, you're in New York and yes, there's another great question. You want to know if I believe herbivores are able to discern or switch off their reproductive instincts uh, on the basis of the fact that there's not enough food to eat and therefore, you know, just kind of save themselves. Mm. Ravi? No, I don't really. 
I mean, we'll see coming up with the impala rut. Maybe it's possible. I think what would happen, though, is that if an animal is in nutritional stress, as any of the animals out here will be, and so will, I mean, by the time the impala mating comes around in May, then obviously their physiology is not going to function in the same way as it might. And what we'll find is that they may well then not come into estrus. Maybe some of them won't come into estrus as much. Maybe some of them won't fall pregnant because the endometrium will not be sufficiently thickened for a fetus to start growing. There's a little giraffe, very little giraffe, trying desperately to try and walk around. Oh, this is my favorite giraffe here. He's got those little paintbrushes on the top of his head. <laughs> Look at him with his little paintbrushes. And Ravi, why are we just talking about that? Of course, there was this great misnomer, and I guarantee you it's still being told as we sit here, that impala are able to withhold giving birth so until favorable conditions. So they have their standard issue, six and a half to seven months gestation period. And then if the rains haven't come yet, they'll simply hold the youngsters in the womb until it rains. Now, this doesn't make any biological sense whatsoever. And I mean, I'd, I'm 99% sure it's not true. And the reason it was sort of thought to be true was because there is a second impala lambing season or breeding season, and some impala will only give birth in February. And we've seen one or two very little impala running around with the other slightly larger lambs. So, Ravi, I, I think it's stories like that that have given rise to the thought that herbivores are able to perhaps uh, prolong or make a conscious decision or make a subconscious physiological decision to hold off having babies and mating. And I'm afraid I just don't buy it myself. But that said, of course, like I say, if an animal is in nutritional stress, then it is definitely going to struggle to A, carry a baby to term, and B, perhaps even become impregnated. Like I say, the complex process of laying down endometrial layer or inner lining to the womb and then implanting an embryo in that, I'm sure would be compromised by not enough to eat. Now, Jandre, I was attacked recently. It was a very painful attack that I had. Can you see my attack, Jandre? Now, I don't have much leg to attack, but that great wound there that you can see, everybody, was from a blister beetle. A blister beetle crawled upon me. I think I slapped him or scraped him with my other foot, and he then spread his cantharidin, a foul substance that irritated my skin deeply. And look at that. I thought it would just go away. It turned out into a blister, and now it has turned into a gaping, festering wound that might result in the amputation of my ankle. I just thought you should all see that because I felt the need for sympathy. Kirsten says she's going to bring out the violins, but she's had enough of me and she'd like to see some zebra with Jamie. So let's go across there and we'll see what else we can find. Seems as though today is a zebra day. To change the subject from James's grievous injury, we've got a wonderful stallion and his harem, a dazzle of zebra is the correct collective noun for a group of zebra like this, which I think is perfect because this is quite a dazzling sight in the morning light. I wanted to talk about, it's so nice because they're actually gonna, I think if we sit nice, we keep our movements nice and slow, they're gonna come right up to us and right past us. Now watching these two little ones, I actually wanted to talk to you a little bit about the sighting that Brent and myself had in Kruger yesterday around a waterhole. There's a very large zebra herd that wandered through and were coming down to drink. And in the process, because there were wildebeest and impala as well, in the process and in the rush, thirsty rush forward to get to water, the, one of the zebra foals became separated and got lost at the back of the group. 
and it stood on the top of the hill calling repeatedly that yip 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 sound that zebras make. And what was so fascinating about it is that it wasn't the mother that called back, it was the other zebra foals within the herd itself. So obviously there's quite a tight bond not just between the offspring and their mothers, but also between the different foals within the herd. It also went to show that that imprinting process on the mom takes a little bit of time and that the herding instinct is incredibly powerful because this little zebra was so confused that it ended up trying to approach a female wildebeest in the hope of some comfort and ended up following her away from the zebra herd for a long distance before working out that in fact this was not its family and maybe kind of worked out that there was a lack of severe lack of stripes in that particular group of animals and went racing back. That's interesting because apparently James has observed exactly the same thing, that zebra foals don't have to imprint on their, so or don't imprint on their mothers yeah. as quickly as we think they do. That being said, I have seen some serious aggression from mares that have been approached by a foal that is not their own. And we've seen before how vicious zebra can actually be. They'll bite and they'll kick. So it's important for that foal, whilst the imprinting doesn't happen instantly, it's important for that foal to be quick on its toes in terms of recognizing its mom. It's a very strictly enforced hierarchy within a zebra herd itself. Hello, little one. There we go. Coming right up next to the car. Such a peaceful sighting. And I think we're actually going to see more and more zebras pushing in from the southern end of Kruger. From what I observed yesterday, there is very little to the east of us that they can actually feed on in terms of grass. It's all been either drought stricken or consumed by animals moving through. That's why we're going to see more and more buffalo and zebra. They're pushing in from Kruger to where there's water and to where there's a little bit of food for them. They're gonna move with the rains. Still in, our zebra are still in good condition. What we'll start to see over the next few months as food gets harder and harder to find is their manes are gonna to start to flop over. And that is the sign of a very sick zebra. And just to discuss, and actually I should have done this ages ago, but James Richard, just to finish off the answer to your question about if Brent and myself saw anything interesting in Kruger, we did. We had the most amazing time. We saw lots of quarry bustards, which is the heaviest flying bird in the world at 17 kilograms. That is disputed. I know that there is dispute about that. But at about 17 kilograms, which equates to about 35 to close to 40 pounds, they are definitely one of the heaviest flying birds. Oh, a little bit of a, little bit of a skirmish there. Oh, somebody's gonna get a kick. You can see what I mean. And not always the friendliest creatures to each other. Little zebra. James, we also saw sesame, which is a first for me, and I think actually Brent said it was a first for him as well in the Kruger Park. Sesame is a type of antelope. Pretty much the closest relative that you could see here, and we could always see them here, of course it's open to the Kruger, but the closest relative would probably be the wildebeest. It's all part of the hartebeest family. So as we saw a ses we saw two sesames. We saw elant up in the north, which is also incredible to see. That's our largest antelope, and in fact the largest antelope in the world. Oh, they're having a serious disagreement now. Let me duck my head down. They all got in each other's space. They weren't very impressed. What else did we see? We saw lots of ground hornbills. Not as many elephants as I was expecting. I was quite surprised. We saw a cheetah. We saw wild dogs. And in fact, we think we saw the orpen pack. For those of you familiar with the different animals around here. And the orpen pack is one of the animals that we could actually get to see. We could see the orpen wild dog pack. It's one of the biggest, in fact, the biggest wild dog pack within the park. There's 35 animals. They were hiding out in a drainage line in the shade. What else did we see? We saw lions, and the awesome thing about that lion sighting was about four cars had driven past those lions without spotting them. He was right next to the road underneath a bush when we went past. Oh, 
best like each other's space. What's going on? Not enjoying each other's company. Could also be a young male that's getting to the stage where he's going to be time for him to leave the herd. Yep, I think that's what that is. That young male on the right is getting in everybody's way. He still remains tightly bonded to his mom, but those bonds will have to be broken. Oh. Shame. He is. It's a teenage boy that's slowly being pushed out of the herd. And he's not very popular. One of those sad realities of herd life. You see it with all of the different animal species, all the different general game species, as well as elephants. Awesome sighting, though. That's an interesting question. To sit and watch these zebra, and it's an animal that we are all so familiar with. And for years and years, we've been taught that those stripes are camouflage mechanisms. And you can see how it does work. And this is in answer to Keith's question, who's read that zebra's stripes are to confuse predators, or to confuse lions, to make it more difficult to single out a sing or to single out one individual zebra when they're hunting them and when they're running away. Now you can sort of see how that would work, and it definitely does play a role in camouflage. But Keith. They're really starting to research now more and more into the reason zebras have stripes because if it was such a perfect camouflage mechanism or disruptive coloration mechanism, why is it that only zebras have it? Why are there no other prey species or general game species that have stripes as camouflage? There they go, they're all going to wander past us here to the right. Keith, they've done a lot of research. The truth is, and it's one of the things that I absolutely love about being out in the bush, is that nobody knows why zebras have stripes. The predominant theory at the moment is that the stripes actually confuse flying insects like tsetse flies that can pass on a, a sickness known as sleeping sickness. And there is research to suggest that zebra in areas where there are tsetse flies, and there would have been tsetse flies, but they've been pushed out by chemicals produced by humans, but there would have been tsetse flies in this area. And there's evidence to suggest that there are far less on zebra than there are on any of the other animal species. And that's because the, the shape of the stripes and the black and the white confuses, this, confuses the landing mechanism and the proprioception of the fly, so they can't land on the zebra themselves. There's one other theory, which to me doesn't hold much water, I don't, I don't buy into it, and that is that the stripes play a role in thermoregulation. So the black stripes heat up faster than the white stripes, as black and white things do, white reflects and bounces the light back, and that causes essentially microcurrents to flow across the skin of the zebra and essentially cool them down. That to me doesn't really make much sense, I don't buy into that. But, I mean, I could be completely wrong. So far, the dominant theory is that stripes are actually an anti-insect mechanism. There's one very pregnant female there. I don't think we're going to get lucky two days in a row, but you never know. I've got Dave on the back. Oh, some more running and galloping about. And as our zebra disappear off behind us, I'm going to continue on to search for more dazzling sights. And while I do that, I believe that James has found another different herd of animals to show you. A breeding herd of buffalo, everybody, but a nervous herd. This herd is not as confiding as some of the other animals of the Sabi Sand Game Reserve. And they are now sort of going to walk around us. It's a little brown colored one. Did you see that? That's a little baby. And I think the herd is split. There are lots of tracks on the road here, and there were reports of them at the Juma Dam pan. And I think some of the herd might be there already having a drink, and I'm pretty sure this particular section is on its way there. But it is now astounded by the sight of a Land Rover or perhaps Jean-Dre's hat. I'm not sure one of the two, and they are now don't really know what to do. So they're going to hide behind some bushes, pretend to be having an eat, and then think about going to drink. Now, Juma Dam Pan is to the right of your screen, or sort of right and behind. There's some big old bulls bringing up the rear. And like I say, I mean, Scott's had this experience with this herd. I've had it a few times with this herd. 
I mean, there are times in the Sabi Sands where you can be sitting in a place like this, so if I'd parked in front of a herd before, they'd just walk either side of you, totally ignore you and keep going. And these guys are just a bit nervous. There are no lions after them, we know that. The Inkahumas are on Simbambili somewhere. A large pride crossed into the Manileti from Sydney's dam earlier this, eve this morning. There's a little little baby one genre, maybe you can see it now. That brown colored, little chocolate brown colored fellow there. There he is, look. Mm -hmm. They are coming slowly closer. This is not a large group, it's probably only about mm, maybe 50 or 60 of them. I'm sure the rest are having a drink now. <coughs> I'm going to find out from Kirsten if she can see what's actually happening at the Juma Dam Pan. And if you can see, let us know. Hashtag Safari Live, questions at wildlife.tv. And if there are a lot more of them there, then we might go and have a look. So they're slowly grazing closer. Now, apparently, Kevin Catfish, you say that the pan is covered in buffalo. I wonder if we shouldn't go there. I think we are going to do that. You know what? Kevin, let's go across to the Juma Dam pan. Let's let these chaps move towards the water. I'm sure that they will join us there at some stage. Lots and lots of buffalo tracks going down the road. And the way you know they're buffalo tracks, well, it just looks like a herd of cattle have walked down the road. Plenty of dung. And if we just quickly show you to the side there, you can see what look like very large tracks of cows walking down the road, many of them. We're not far from the pan, only about half a minute. Hold on, everybody, to your hats. A bit of road maintenance going on here, that's good to see. It's interesting that the herd seems to have been split up. I'm not sure why that would be the case. I don't think there's anything that's eaten the buffalo around here for the last little while. Well, the Jumadam pan will continue to be um, slightly more, more heavily used. <laughs> James Bear, you worried about where we are? i you my fessery. Oh, there are lots of buffalo there. I think we're going to. <laughs> Sorry about that, everyone. James, the nearest medical facility is, well, facility is in no half hour drive, but we can get many back on a helicopter if we have to. Sorry, have to. Sorry, let me just turn the car properly. Sorry, John. Now, you can see them here staring at us, worried. This group is about, I think, the same size as the other group. It might be worth just sitting here to see if they come down. And I mean, one or two of them come down, they've looked, they've run back up towards the, the, the pan. I just don't understand why. Nervous of, uh, of vehicles, should I say. People I can understand. Let's just watch and what unfolds here. The hippo's obviously gone. But James, um, if I seriously, I don't actually need medical attention on my foot, obviously. Uh, we have a first aid kit. <laughs> and I can put a little plaster on if I get very sore. And then for sort of serious events, like, I mean, one of the staff the other day, not one of our staff, had a suspected heart attack. Uh, there are people with first aid training here. 
and then there's a paramedic who's about 45 minutes away, sort of permanently on site at one of the other lodges. And then there are some clinics outside of the reserve in the villages, which you can use, for, you know, if you've got a minor issue that you need to go and have sorted out, you can. But if you break a leg or get bitten by a mumbo or something like that, you've got to get to Nelspreit, which is about two and a half hours away. It appears as though we've lost James temporarily. It seems, although it is wonderful to have Wendy back up and running, it seems as though she comes with one or two tech issues to be sorted out, and they will fix those as quickly as possible. In the meantime, I was just thinking about James Richard's question about what amazing things we saw in Kruger. And I have to tell you that as amazing as our animal sightings were, we did have incredibly good luck. At the same time, for me, what really stood out was the most phenomenal scenery I have ever, ever seen in Kruger. It's an area that I've never personally been to, right up to the north there, along the Levuvu River. And I saw trees that made my jaws drop. The baobabs, those enormous baobab trees, which I'm sure many of you know about, and of course we're a little bit too far south to actually see them, but trees thousands of years old, gigantic jackalberries that look like, that make even the biggest jackalberry on Juma, like the ones at Twin Dams, make them look like absolute babies in comparison. And these stunning nyala trees. Now, that's also a tree species that you don't see many of. I don't even think there's one on Juba, to be completely honest. If there is, I haven't found it yet. But these, I don't know how to describe, they're picture book trees, enormous, great sweeping boughs. Really something phenomenal to see. And to look at the thick riverine vegetation and to see buffalo, and there was an enormous herd of buffalo, but just all you could see were these little heads poking out of the bush. And the animals as well, there's something so distinctly wild about them. They don't see that many cars, they don't see that many people. And to spend a bit of time there was fascinating. And also the history of the area. So we went up to a place known as Crook's Corner. Now Crook's Corner was a beacon that sat and sort of in the no man's land between South Africa, Zimbabwe and Mozambique. So essentially outside of anyone's jurisdiction and the story goes there. Oh, yep. As soon as you stop, they run. There's a pair of grey dacre, or common dacre. But yes, a crook store, Crook's Corner is apparently where all of the, the crooks, the bad guys, used to go. The, the elephant um, ivory smugglers and the black market traders. They used to go there, and when the authorities were after them, they used to go and sit on the beacon. This is the way the story goes. They would go and sit on the beacon and laugh at the authorities of the different countries, fighting over whose jurisdiction they fell into. Or they'd go across, for example, if they were being pursued by South African authorities, they'd go across into Mozambique, sit behind the beacon and wave at them. And that was the history and the story behind Crook's Corner, the place where the Limpopo flows past, although unfortunately not flowing at the moment, but in theory, the great grey greasy Limpopo flows past between, that divides two in, or three enormous and incredibly diverse countries. I'm making my way towards Sydney's dam to find out whether anything's decided to go and have a drink. In the meantime, James is back up and running and still with the buffalo at Juma Dam. Okay, we've just come around here to where there is some more signal. Here come the rest of the buffalo now. They're coming across the dam. We're quite close to them, so I'm going to talk very quietly, which I hope will still be audible wherever you happen to be sitting on planet Earth. They've become a lot more confiding, but you can see they're still trying to smell us, their noses in the air, trying to pick us up, see what we're about, why are we here, trying desperately to get a, a whiff, and we were chatting about smell earlier on. 
A buffalo is a classic example. They can see us. They see us just about every day. They know what we are. But if the wind turns and they smell human being, they immediately get a fright. This is really cool. Check how many there are coming now. I think this is just amazing. How many do we think? Probably about 200 here now. Maybe not quite that many. Ooh, very nice question, Gavin. You say, why is it that animals out here are referred to as gain, game. Has it got to do with hunting? Does it stem from hunting? Yes, Gavin, I think it does. I think it's absolutely correct. It stems from a hunting term. And it's a little bit like the term uh, big five. It's entirely a hunting term. In my mind, it beyond, belongs in the scrap heap of history. Um, but it's still used endlessly by people who market safaris the big five, we have to see the big five. And of course the big five referred to the animals that were the most dangerous to hunt. And we've, because of that, come up with this notion that animals out here are dangerous, that um, buffalo are dangerous animals to be around. And that's just ridiculous. Buffalo are only dangerous if you try and shoot them or if you happen to be a lion, if you try and hunt to them, then they are very dangerous. So yes, game from hunting. Look at these wonderful chaps. So a breeding herd of buffalo, just to give you an idea of what the sort of social situation here is, mixed herd of males and females and their youngsters. Often the females will have some kind of relationship to each other. They may or may not be um, related, but uh, quite often they are. And then the males within a herd like this will be variously dominant and not dominant. So there is a hierarchy of dominance. But very interestingly, I think what you'll find is that even the most dominant males will not be able to manipulate breeding opportunities. And so if you are a young buffalo and you can keep your nose out of trouble and uh, you don't get into too much you know, conflict with the dominant bulls, you probably still have some mating opportunities. And normally what happens, it's what I quite like about it, it's like a democracy, where they decide where to move uh, based on a kind of consensus. Normally what will happen is a pathfinding female, normally an old female will wander off in one direction, then she'll come back to the group. And maybe another old female will wander off in another direction, then she'll come back to the group. And then based on a consensus, they'll all wander off in one direction together. Females at the front, Babies in the middle, males normally then fringing these flanks and out and uh, back side of the herd in order to protect it from attack. It's a tiny little one there, Jandri. Uh, very small, oh sorry. Catherine, do you want to know if the buffalo wander in and out or if they stay at Juma? Remember, Juma is only 1,500 hectares. In fact, Juma itself is probably only 900 hectares. And so for a buffalo home range, they wouldn't be able to survive on an area this small, so they do definitely go in and out. And what you find is they spend a lot of time on Biffle's Hook. Uh, they spend quite a lot of time, I think, on Torchwood. And they'll come wandering on here and then go back out to the north, sometimes a little bit to the south of here. So they're probably operating on an area of about, I'd say, 10,000 hectares, which is 24,000 acres. That'll be the average home range of a herd of buffalo like this. This is not a big herd. I mean, it's big for this particular area simply because we don't see big herds of buffalo like this but you do find far, far larger herds of buffalo in the general area. I mean, I've seen a herd of a thousand strong ones just up north of here. That was in the winter time. 
and normally I mean, we're kind of in a winter situation here with concentrated water everywhere, very little grazing. And the buffalo have still managed to maintain condition, but if you look around at all of them now, you can start to see that their hips are starting to show. Now that is a sign simply of the fact that the drought is beginning to take its toll. And as I've said before, this particular time of the year, yes, the animals are gonna feel it a bit, but it's not now that we're really gonna feel the effects of the drought. It's as we go into winter, when we know that there won't be any rain, when the growth season is over, where even if we do get rain, there will hardly be a flush of grass. It's then that we're going to feel the effects of this. Now, Lois, you are in buffalo. Ha ha ha. Um, Lois, you want to know if the buffalo have come here out of habit to the water? Yes, they know where water is. Uh, the older females, will, the pathfinders will lead them to where the different path, bits of water are. They will know where all the water holes of the area are. They will know where the natural pans are. So if there is a big rain, they will know exactly where to get that fresh rain rather than coming to a pan like this, which after one visit from a herd of buffalo this side is going to become a soup of dung and urine. Nice question, Lois. That's absolutely what will happen. Just listen to the oxpeckers calling. Hello, Peter, in the United Kingdom. You say one of the males was drooling some saliva. Is he okay? Is he perhaps ill, perhaps rabid? Um, Peter, it's totally normal for buffalo. If you watch cattle sometimes, you'll see them doing the same thing. They will drool. And I think it's got a lot to do, Peter, with the fact that they do regurgitate their food. And so what happens is I think there's a lot of saliva produced during that process. And they do produce a lot of saliva and sometimes it just kind of drips out. If they're sick, I think you'd see a lot more seeping from the nose. Um, generally, you know, the mucus, mucus produ producing glands in the nose would start to would start to leak and uh, I mean if they've got bovine tuberculosis and it's taking hold I mean they can carry it but all of these buffalo will carry bovine TB uh, but if that's actually affecting them they'll start to get snotty nose and they'll start to cough a lot but I don't think the dripping of saliva is necessarily a sign of illness I do see it quite a lot Peter it is very well noticed however I'm impressed you noticed that this cow here was just dripping some saliva as well Very nice. Finally, we, he's returned to us. Super Cecil from Hamans Kral. Haven't heard from you for a very long time. Very good to, to have you back with us, Super Cecil. You want to know if a buffalo's horns keep growing all the time, or do they, if they stop growing? I think what you'll find is they do keep growing slowly. They will definitely slow down though. And then when the buffalo gets very old, they'll stop growing. So I've seen some, I mean, def, until a bull is probably 10 or 11 years old, his horns will keep growing, and he's got a potential lifespan in this area of up to 16 or so. <laughs> this one cow is very fascinated by us. She's trying to smell Jandre. Oh, she didn't like that Jandre, did she? Now, Trail X, you think that they think we are part of the herd. I see, I don't think that. I th I've definitely had that experience with buffalo before where they just do seem to think that you're part of the herd. But here, the moment, they just keep looking at us, you know. They're, they're very surprised by us. They don't like the smell of us. One of them's laying down, so perhaps relaxing a little bit. You can see the water there coming out. That's because this pan is pumped 
And so that will at least provide some kind of dilution to the amazing suite of macronutrients and micronutrients, sorry, that they've put into the water. No doubt result in an algal bloom, an attack of insects, which in turn will enthrall the terrapins that live in the water there. Catfish, you were probably with us yesterday when we were watching this herd, commenting on the fact that there didn't seem to be many ox peckers around it. And you're saying that you can hear them all and there are lots about now. There are lots of ox peckers today. Maybe yesterday was an ox pecker public holiday. I'm not sure why there weren't any about, but you can see one there on the back of the female on your screen hopping about a red-billed ox pecker. I mean, it's a good idea to just keep looking out for a yellow build variety. We do get them around here, especially around this pan. Much more rare than the red build friend. And supposedly that relationship is a classic example of a symbiosis where one animal survives off the other, but that they, you know, they both benefit from the situation. It looks more and more or it sometimes looks like, and I think there are a lot of biologists who would agree with this, that it is a parasitic relationship where the oxpecker is actually getting quite a lot more out of the relationship than the buffalo are. Yes, the buffalo have the ticks taken off them, but if there's an injury, the oxpeckers definitely keep it open. And for a long time we thought, well, maybe that just keeps it clean of bacteria, and actually it's quite a good thing for the buffalo. But I think we studies have shown that it isn't necessarily and that it actually becomes the site of infection. So it can be a bit of a parasitic relationship, which is interesting because it's normally held out as the most obvious example of an animal symbiosis. It's a good word for the morning, jean -Ray, don't you think? Symbiosis. Yeah. Would you like to say it? Symbiosis. There we go. Well done. Symbiosis. <laughs> Here are some latecomers, jean -Ray. One young bull at the back, a big adult at the, in the middle, and then two ladies in the front. They've been going on a little double date. Let's head across to Jamie, see what she's got for you. I'll spend a little bit more time with these buffalo and then we'll see what else we can find. Now, interestingly enough, my plan is actually at some point to go and join those buffalo as well. We've got the ball of GoPros on the front, our virtual reality rig. And we've been trying to put together different clips to show you that will give you the most incredible ability. And most of you by now, I think, would have seen some of the clips that we've produced. But basically, it gives you the ability to look. And depending on what device you, look, you, you are using, whether it's a smartphone or a, one of the iPads, you can actually move around and decide where you want to look in that particular clip. So at some point, because big animals work particularly well with this particular setup, at some point we're going to wander across and go and do a little bit of a segment with the virtual reality rig. In the meantime, I've just been re-exploring Juma, getting acquainted with the lie of the land. It's amazing how much you miss in 10 days. When you're out every day, twice a day, you get to know roughly where all of the animals are. You get an idea of what everything's up to away you almost instantly lose that grasp of what's happening around you. Particularly for me doing this gives me a nice opportunity to see just how much groundwater there is in terms of possible drinking sources and where the animals might decide to go because clearly there's not enough groundwater for a big herd of buffalo like that they have to go to the pumped pan. Yesterday afternoon as well we saw I mentioned that animals were pushing in more and more from Kruger. And yesterday afternoon, Brent and I were out on tracking team. And as we drove up to the Juma Pan, there was an elephant bull drinking there. And he was very, very clearly a Kruger elephant. 
and I'm talking about not necessarily the main busy parts of Kruger, I'm talking one of the big wide expanses and there are huge expanses of unexplored er territory within Kruger National Park itself. And this elephant was so skittish. Not, I mean, he, he didn't run away, but he clearly was uncomfortable with the vehicle and it took him a long time, much longer than the usual elephants that we see around here. It took him a long time to get used to our presence. But he was very much enjoying the fresh water that was coming through from the pan. Now, although this drought is at times heartbreaking to see, it is going to present us with all kinds of new and, in a way, fascinating sightings, the way that we can observe how the animals adapt and change. What fascinated me about that entire trip through Kruger is in theory, the northern section of Kruger is the driest section there is. And yet it is in the complete opposite at the moment. They've clearly had far more rain than any of the southern areas, including Juma. It's bright green. The buffalo are looking fit, they're looking healthy. When you compare it to the buffalo and the zebra further south that are starting already to show signs of not distress, but definitely a lot of them losing condition. And what happens with the animals when they start, particularly with, for example, something like a buffalo, maybe even with the warthog as well, a lot of the buffalo carry tuberculosis, but they don't really suffer from the symptoms of it. A healthy buffalo will be able to live a nice, long and happy life without being concerned about the symptoms of TB. But as soon as they start to lose condition, as soon as they lose a bit of weight, that tuberculosis kicks in and they become very ill animals. And I think um, my prediction is that we're going to be seeing more and more of that over the next few months. Oh, well, I loop back towards the Zinyala. The buffalo have made their way to go and have a drink at the dam, so let's pop over and have a look. Buffalo drinking, um, water that you and I would scarcely put our toes in, let alone agree to put in our mouths. Uh, doesn't affect the buffalo at all, doesn't affect any of the animals. And they're amazing, especially the predators, will come and drink really muddy, foul kind of soupy water that would leave you with a case of serious amoebic dysentery. And uh, just doesn't affect the animals out here. Their stomachs can cope with it. They have the constitution of a hyena, or like Brent Leo Smith. Um, I think Brent could probably drink this stuff too and he'd be okay, but for the rest of us, it wouldn't be possible. John, if you don't mind looking at this one here, this last straggling cow, and by straggling I just mean she's not with the rest of the herd, she's got grey hair. You see, she's got little specks of grey on her. Experienced old lady who's wandered the wilderness probably for the last 15 years or so. She's looking pretty good nick though, but she's the first buffalo I've ever seen that's got that obvious spotting of grey hair. Now the rest of the herd has walked off into the east and south. I think they will probably settle down in that block there where they are now. They'll graze a little, settle down there, lie in the shade and chew their cud for much of the rest of the day. It's quite nice to see her running after the rest of the herd. She doesn't look like the most athletic lady in the world, but why would she? She's now greying, experienced and grizzled. And here goes the bull after them. <laughs> Do you think this is like the sort of um, grandfatherly or grandparently couple, Jandre? Maybe? Granddad and grandma. Now, although neither of them looked like they were particularly impressive athletes as they were running along there, let me assure you that when push comes to shove, they will move with a great speed and they still both contain incredible strength. Even though they look like they're slightly arthritic. Right, we're going to leave the buffalo going off into the southeast. I'm going to go back towards quarantine clearing, see if I can't find my little baby zebra friend. And let's go to some Nyala with Jamie. <laughs> I'm trying to, this might actually be the best position. A huge herd, 
comparatively. Ovignana is about 10 or 11 all moving through the bushes together. Interesting, I've never seen Inyala herds in the same way I have here. There's a male in front. You see the difference in size and color once the females start to come through. There they are. The tan-colored female on the left, or several tan-colored females on the left, and the much darker, much larger male at the back. I think our best position is going to be to go backwards. He's having a jolly good sniff. See if there's any possibility of females in estrus. Let's try there. Lots of mixed ages. There's a couple of young males that still have the tan female coloring. Now to go back to the stripe question, because we discussed it with the zebra, um, this is one example of where stripes really do serve a disruptive coloration um, purpose. So those stripes, you can see now as we look at them through the trees, you can see how the stripes disrupt the shape of the animal. And basically, instead of camouflaging it, essentially break up the outline so that it becomes more difficult for predators to in pick out individual antelope. Works very well if you're looking at them through the bushes like this and gives them a much better chance of escaping unscathed from a predator attack. There's the overeager male looking for an opportunity. He'd better be quick though because I definitely saw another big male and looked larger than him wandering through. If we try and. Oh, they're gonna look at this. What an awesome little group. And they're so nice and relaxed. Look at that. I don't even know if there's a collective noun for a herd of Inyala. More interesting than a herd. Awesome in the morning light. A couple of youngsters moving about in the front. And of course, if we really wanted to, we could identify each individual Inyala by the stripe pattern. So every single Inyala has a different stripe pattern. <laughs> with a male in hot pursuit. Okay. That's awesome. I don't think I've had an Inyala sighting like that. Let's try to get ahead of him. There we go. And you watch them disappear into fairly dense vegetation. Oh, generally, when we do see Inyala, they're hidden away in this type of bush. They much prefer the denser habitats. Oops, somebody startled there. So they generally prefer, prefer the drainage line systems, somewhere where they can hide rather than be out in the open. And it's one of the reasons, one of the interesting explanations behind the difference between the males and the females. For the males, that flashy coloration and those big horns are necessary as part of a reproductive strategy. So essentially for wooing the females and intimidating other males and chasing them away. But for the females, that is completely unnecessary. They don't need horns for protection because they hide away and rely rather on their cryptic coloration and their camouflage. There's the other male, I wondered where he was. I knew I'd seen two somewhere. And that particular male, unfortunately, he's disappeared before I could show you, but his horns are absolutely covered in mud. And very often, you very often see that. Now, Nyalas breed all year round, so the males have to be in fighting form throughout the year. What they often do is rub their faces in mud. Nobody actually really knows why they do this. It's one of those strange little idiosyncrasies of nature. We know that they've got glands around their eyes, so that might have something to do with it, sort of passing the scent, putting their scent down on the ground. But they specifically target muddy and watery areas. And they often come up with thick layers of mud around the horns. And there's one theory that actually suggests that it makes them look even bigger and more intimidating. I have to be honest, though, I personally don't think it makes them look a little bit silly. 
the Ganyalas have vanished off down into the drainage line where they like to be. I'm not sure if we ever actually figured out which antelope species Karula managed to kill yesterday. I know that when we were there, I personally, <laughs> Brent and I had a slight disagreement. He said it looked like an impala. I said it looked more like a bushbuck. Look at that, they're actually having a drink. There's water there. Try go. That's maybe as good as it's gonna get. Drinking in one of the mud wallows. Little fluffy tails and that flash of white. Now just to finish off a discussion that we were having about the drought, or to continue a discussion we were having about the drought, the one thing that we're going to also start seeing, apart from slightly more cases of TB, there's always the possibility of anthrax, and that's something that is a naturally occurring bacteria in this particular area, but you hardly ever see it except in times, or see it taking action except in times of drought. And drought, when the animals start to graze closer to the soil, a lot of the sort of top layers of soil have been blown away, the spores start to be ingested. And at this point, we've spoken about it before, if we find an animal carcass where it's not immediately clear that it's been killed by a predator, we're absolutely going to avoid it. And that's because anthrax is transmissible to human beings, as I'm sure most of you know. But Rame was wondering what happens if there is an anthrax outbreak in the area? Would we move? Would people move to a different area? And the answer is generally not no. What, they, what you do do is you call in experts who come in their special hazmat suits, specially designed to be impervious to the anthrax spores and they come and they dispose of the carcass in a way that prevents the spread further. That being said, unless you are actually actively touching and breathing in parts of that carcass, and unless it is a very, very fresh anthrax death, for the most part, as soon as a carcass starts to decompose, the natural decomposition bacteria that occur in all of those processes immediately outcompete the anthrax bacteria. So it's, it's not that easy for anthrax to spread from a carcass to a human being, unless you are actually handling it, if you are touching the blood or the saliva, or if you're breathing in close to it. So people are always a lot more careful, but generally it's not something that is a huge risk in this particular area. And I personally, even though I've, I've been around for a couple of anthrax outbreaks, I cannot think of one person who's been naturally infected by um, by anthrax in this area, in these kind of circumstances. It is something that is a distinct possibility. We could see it in the next few weeks. And it might have been, I mentioned that we saw a couple of dead buffalo within Kruger. Personally, I think they were probably just, they lost condition, they didn't get enough food, they were probably old and weak to begin with. But it could also have been anthrax-related deaths. We've spoken a lot before. For tiny fenced reserves and for farmers and for the general population this drought is a terrible thing. That being said, within the Kruger area itself, within our four million hectares of unfenced wilderness area, it's actually not going to do damage that the ecosystem can't recover from. Sorry, Deb, put you at a bit of an angle there. There's a stunning Inyala bull hiding in their favorite places. It must be about 20 different individual Inyala we've seen in this group. He's following behind the ladies. As we move on, we've seen a really nice clear distinction between the males and the females in Yala, female in Yala. And it's a very, very, it's an enormous size difference. They've actually got the greatest sexual dimorphism of any of the antelope species. It's one of the reasons 
reasons why the division happens between the different naming of the different animals. So with anything smaller, anything the size of a Nyala female or smaller is referred to either as a ram or a ewe. So in Pala, for example, are rams and ewes. But anything the size of an Nyala male and larger will be referred to as a cow and a bull. So a kudu cow, a kudu bull. It's where that distinction happens in the, in the naming of the antelope males and females. But that is a tremendous, it's probably about double the size in terms of the difference. And Harper was wondering, since that is such a clear, I and mean, there's such enormous animals, would a leopard be able to take one down? Because Harper suggested it seems unlikely. It is actually unlikely. It is possible. I have seen it happen before. Um, it would be a very, very big male leopard. So an animal like Tingana or the Anderson male, the Anderson male has been known to kill small giraffe before. And I, that, that is a seriously large animal. And there are a couple of recorded cases of leopards also killing buffalo calves. So an Yala bull would be on the menu. I don't think a leopard of Karula's size would be up to the challenge. And I don't think that she'd actually risk it. For her, it's not worth the risk. There's big horns, thrashing hooves, and that's an enormous pig. My goodness, that's a big warthog. No, don't go away, please, boy. We want to look at how enormous you are. Look at those huge tusks. Off he goes, tail in the air in alarm. Drought's also the reason we've had so many relaxed warthog sightings. They're getting more and more comfortable around people because this is where they need to be. Around water, pumped water holes where there are lots of, where there's lots of human activity. That was an absolutely enormous male. I wish he was slightly less skittish though. Unfortunately, he's not. His tusks were probably about that long, easily. Another example of an animal that it is unlikely that a leopard would mess with unless it absolutely had to. A big male like Tingana could maybe do it. interesting, um, and I, I keep harping back to the leave I've just been on, but obviously it's fresh in my memory. Sandblaster was wondering, since human beings have been in this area for thousands and thousands of years, are there any archaeological sites within Juma and Arethusa? Not specifically, I've just come from a place known as Tulamela, or just south of Tulamela, which was part of an ancient late Iron Age civilization, all connected to Map a place called Mapungubwe, sitting up in the triangle. A lot of you might have seen that famous golden rhino statue that came from that archaeological site, the Mapungubwe heritage site, but it's connected to the same civilization that then moved across to Tulamela. And Tulamela had very interesting social structures. It had essentially a king that lived separated from the rest of his citizens and then a village built all around him in a way that is actually still almost traditionally practiced by a lot of the vendor people of that area. In terms of what you could find here, however, that does not mean that there's nothing here. We've been speaking about it because Brent and myself were wandering through the reserve that his parents lived on, and we actually saw something in Kruger as well. There are so many relics of a time in which people moved through here in a much more primitive fashion, if you could call it that. So you'd be able to find stone cutting tools, and we could do a walk through here, and there is a very good chance that we could actually find them. You just have to know what to look for, and you just have to be specifically really focusing on looking for that. You very often find grinding stones. I found quite a few of those, so big flat stones that have been used to grind a minute, a type of carbohydrate. Here goes our pig again. This poor pig, I'm not trying to follow you, boy. Oh, James has found an interesting bird. Let's go and have a look. Oh, shit. This is so exciting, everybody. I know this isn't a great picture. I'm going to try and get you a closer picture. But for those of you who keep bird lists, this bird is not on your, most of your lists. It's a Bennett's woodpecker. It's one of the four woodpecker species that we get here. It's the least common. And I originally spotted it because it is Jandre feeding on the... Ground. Correct. A Bennett's woodpecker is a ground-feeding woodpecker. Very nice. 
nice. Now, I'm going to try and get a little bit closer. We are not, of course, with the super zoom lens. So let's see if we can ease our way a little bit closer to that special bird. There's lots of bird activity here, which makes me think that there are probably termites and things coming out of the ground. Jean-Henri, can you still see him? Yeah. Yeah, there he is. I'm not going to go any closer than this. There we go. Just pulled off. It is woodpecker. I will show you a picture. But there he is. Believe it. Very obvious black moustachial streak. Black mask around the eyes. Small red cap. Very nice, Jean-Dre. See? Hop, hop, hopping on the ground. I'll even play you the call. Such is my magnanimity. Can you say that word, genre? Magnanimity. It's not an easy one. Magnanimity. Yeah, sort of. <laughs> okay. Let's have a look here. Now. This I'm very much mistaken. He's that one there. The female bearded woodpecker, not bearded. <laughs> female Bennett's woodpecker there. Very cool. Nice, huh? I'm just, is he still there? I'm going to have one more look, just in case I'm a mistake. I'm 90% sure I'm not. I just... It's only the Bennets I know that feeds on the ground, and it did look very much like that, but those moustachial streaks just didn't look quite black enough. Is At least brown enough. Is he yeah, gone? I don't see him. I don't see him either. I think he's gone. We're going to call Bennets on that. And anybody who would like to dispute it is welcome to. But I'm pretty sure that's what we have there. I'll play you the call quickly, and we'll just see if he doesn't call back. Now, there can sometimes be a bit of concern over playing bird calls. I don't have a problem with it as long as you don't harass the birds. Let's just quickly see. Jim, jim, jim. Field guide, woodpecker, spelled w, ah, oh, ah, oh, de, te. Okay. Got him. Right, here we go. Bennett's. Clear sound. So we'll just play it once. Stop and see if we get a reply. Or a response of any kind. No, nothing. Nothing at all. Hmm. Very cool. Yeah. And that, I think, if I was to show you the picture there, it was a female Bennett's. I'm pretty sure I like that. You happy with that, Jondre? Yes. Good. There we go. Very nice. And Lucy, you're in South Bend, Indiana. You say that is number 183 for you. Well done, Lucy. Good. Marvellous. Well, that's a turn up for the books. Now, I suspect quite strongly that you're going to lose signal as soon as I leave here. So if we do, I'm sorry about that. But we're going to head down south to where signal should be a bit stronger, towards Impala Plains. The Plains of Impala. Says we're still okay signal wise for now. 
beautiful skies, lovely clouds, different levels of clouds all over, which just makes the kind of sky broken up and beautiful kind of definition. Hello, Vincent in Ohio. You're an ornithologist, and you want to know about the species of heron that we get here. Well, uh, the most interesting one so far found was recently found by Scott. That's the black-crowned night heron. Uh, we get those. We get the grey heron. We would find maybe in a wet year a green-backed heron. Well, certainly down on the river you find green-backed heron. You find little bittern down, which is a kind of heron, down on the rivers. Uh, what else would we find? Goliath heron down there. Um, we find three species of egret, and the egrets are basically herons. So the great white egret, the cattle egret, and the little egret. We find all of those here. Um, um, I think that's probably about it. Night well, black crown night heron, yeah. You might also, well, you would probably also find the other night heron, the, um, which is now white, white backed night heron. Yes, white backed night heron. How have I forgotten this? Black crown night heron and I think it's white backed night heron, that's correct. So we've got the two night herons. We've got the grey heron, which is the kind of standard issue heron, a goliath heron, which is a very large standard issue heron, the three egret species. Uh, so that takes us to eight species of heron. We've got the green backed, the little bitten, and maybe a dwarf bitten as well. Maybe a no, not a squawker. So we've got almost 10 species of heron. Very nice, Vincent. Let's go back to Jamie, get an update from her. We'll catch you on the other side of Impala Plains. Continue on with our conversation that we've been having with you, or you've been having with James about birds. I was just thinking about our time in Kruger again, sorry, but um, the fact that we saw in the north we saw more yellow billed oxpeckers than we did red billed oxpeckers. Now, for conservationists, that is a really impressive recovery of a population that was essentially extinct in this area. It's one of those wonderful conservation success stories where yellow billed oxpeckers were reintroduced into an area. The reason that they suffered so badly and why the population took such an enormous dive was actually the introduction of pesticides. So we were talking earlier about the tsetse flies around the zebra and the fact that we no longer see them in this area. And that was initially because of the DDTs that were introduced to push mosquitoes and tsetse flies further north towards the Limpopo River and away from human habitation. One of the reasons why it took the sort of the western colonies far longer to make their way into this particular area and why there's such an incredible history like the one we were talking about earlier because the local people actually got to enjoy this area before being pushed out by colonizing powers but yes the introduction of DDTs and the effect that it has because of course it doesn't discriminate between good insects and bad insects and will affect ticks flies and mosquitoes alike as well as anything right down to the dung beetles and the millipedes and it had a tremendous knock-on effect in terms of the actual wildlife i think we picked up a passenger and by that i mean i think i've driven over a stick that's now clinging to the bottom of the car maybe not we managed to dislodge it. This morning I accidentally smacked Dave in the face. He's actually been very forgiving. I accidentally smacked poor old Dave in the face. He was looking over to try and see if we could get the branch out of the wheels and it flicked up and smacked him. There's all kinds of dangers out here from blister beetles to flying sticks. to continue on with our oxpecker discussion was wondering if oxpeckers and rhino are symbiotic since oxpeckers could potentially warn rhino of impending danger the best thing that they do for the rhino is the same for the buffalo and that is to remove those itchy terrible ticks and rhino do get very serious or really uncomfortable let's rephrase it that way very uncomfortable tick infestations particularly around the tender soft areas the nose the ears and underneath the tail 
the ox packers help them out like that, but yes, that's a good point. They could actually warn the rhino of impending danger. And it's a very useful way when you are if when you are walking in the bush to be warned either way that there is a large animal. It could be anything from a giraffe to an impala, but it could also be a buffalo or a rhino as you're walking through. You hear ox pickers dislodged, you generally know that there's something ahead of you. Very, very useful. You can actually watch them and look where they land and use them to follow, which is interesting yesterday with that little elephant that I was telling you about, that young elephant bull that had obviously come in from Kruger. And the ox pickers, because they eat a thousand ticks a day, they get very thirsty and they spend a lot of time around water. And they were trying to, they'd obviously come to Juma Dam for drinking, they were trying to settle down on the elephant. And every time they did, the elephant would swat it with their trunk. And that's why we never see that symbiotic riotic relationship. And speaking of birds, James has found more nets pop over there. Well, we were looking at a golden, there's another one. A golden backed or European bee eater. It's flown away now. Oh, how irritating. But there is a little beautiful singing magpie shrike over there. And then on the ground, there were a whole lot of wattled starlings. For those who haven't seen, we're just going to sneak forward and see if we can't get them. There they go. Some red billed, but there's a red billed buffalo weaver as well in that tree. But there was a whole flock of those starlings. Let's go look forward and see if we can't get him. Oh, there they are. Jandri, they're on the top right hand side of this knob thorn tree over here. Do you see them? Well done. Good job. And the bee eaters are still around. There are the wattled starlings, everybody. A very interesting starling species, a nomad. Not always found here, but they are around now. There you can see them, and you can hear the bee eaters going bloop, 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 just above us. And then away. Up above. This I watch her. If you are ever in a position where you feel bereft, upset, sad, miserable, melancholic, might I suggest that you take the time to go and lie down in a clearing somewhere and watch the flight of an eagle or a vulture above you with total silence around. It is the best possible way to contemplate the realities of life, I find. Of course, if you live in New York, that's going to be difficult. So, Ravi, I wouldn't suggest you go outside and lie on the street and try and see a vulture. I think that will result in increased stress and more sadness. Would you say, jean -Bain? Quite so. Then there was a woodland kingfisher that flew into this tree here. I find watching s swallows and swifts has the same effect. It flew off, didn't it, jean -Dry? Dirty bird. Let us carry on. Now, there seems to be quite a lot going on in this clearing. I wonder if there isn't some kind of insect emergence. There was also a humble dove around here. Now, the humble dove is quite interesting. It's a seed-eating bird. And unlike the seed-eating birds like finches, which have a specially designed beak to bite off the husks of the seeds that they eat, the dove and um, of the sand grass will just swallow the seeds whole. And in the stomach, of course, is something called a gizzard, which is a muscular pouch and it's often got stones in it as well to help digest food. And that gizzard will basically remove the dehusk the seed within the stomach, which I think is an amazing adaptation. a built-in dehusker in your stomach. Let's go a little bit quicker. There's a nice clearing around the corner here that I just want to have a look at. See if there aren't one or two birds there. Some 
butterflies coming out as the air starts to warm. Impalas are running across the road. So Ravi in New York, <laughs> another good one. You say, wouldn't I say that the ecosystem is basically a giant example of symbiotic relationships where everything from this, I'm paraphrasing here, from the size of bacteria up to the most enormous mammals that we have up here contribute to each other's survival. Yes, I suppose I would say that, but let us not discount, of course, that that balance is also maintained by pathogens and parasites, and the numbers of which are intimidating if you actually start to look at it but they too played a crucial role in maintaining what is um, we call it a balanced ecosystem but certainly a, an ecosystem of dynamic balance if you like so it is constantly changing but there is a sort of dynamic balance that stops it tipping over towards any one direction and yes the bacteria uh, the protozoans the parasites the ticks the elephants the termites the antelope the predators they all keep it going in this kind of dynamic balance nothing in this clearing which is distressing to my person and well just a few minutes left of this drive. So we'll drive along here, past what we were hoping was going to be a productive mongoose den that we went past yesterday three times, failed to find any mongoose there, but we did eventually get some. And I'd like to see Scott's footage of the mongoose. I think he got some really good stuff yesterday with his GoPro. He's tremendously skilled at that sort of thing. Uh, skills, unfortunately, will be sorely missed when he moves on uh, less tomorrow. And just a reminder, we will be having a short fireside chat this evening from about half the world. What would it be? About half past six. And that's where Scott will share a couple of highlights of his time here at Wild Earth. Don't forget, a real treat this afternoon. Uh, Nikki and Scott will be taking the drive together, which will be very nice indeed. All right, that's it from us. Thank you, jean for your efforts. Thank you for putting up with me today. A very nice drive. Thank you to all of you for your questions and comments. We thank you to Kirsten, of course, in the final control with Louise. And we'll hand you back over to Jamil refreshed back from her leave, being filmed, who's filming Jamil by David. And we'll see you this afternoon at four o'clock. Bye-bye. Refreshed and thrilled to be back. Thank you all once again for your wonderful words of welcome. I'm very happy to be back with you once again and exploring the wildernesses of Juma and Arethusa. Unfortunately, our buffalo herd has escaped us. We were going to try and do a virtual reality segment, but they appear to have run off into the bushes somewhere. I'm just going across for one last check up on Galago Waterhole, Galago Pan. If maybe there's a chance we might catch them there. Otherwise, sorry, Dave, we didn't manage this time around. Now, we had a couple of comments to say that from people.